Welcome to tonight's meeting of the Port Phillip City Council. The City of Port Phillip respectfully acknowledges the Yalakut Willem clan of the Boon Wurrung. We pay our respects to their elders, both past and present. We acknowledge and uphold their continuing relationship to this land. Tonight, everyone, we're conducting this meeting in a hybrid style with councillors, officers and members of the public in the town hall, albeit under strict conditions. Some officers and members of the community will continue to participate virtually via the WebEx platform. This meeting is also being streamed live uh, via Council's webcast page and Facebook Live. Whilst we operate in an online mode, there is always the risk, actually it's also the risk in our physical mode of technical issues that are arising beyond our control. If we do experience difficulties tonight, we will adjourn the meeting for a short time to resolve the issue. Apologies. Councillors, do we have any apologies? I see that we are all here, so there are none. Two, the minutes of the previous meetings. Councillors, the minutes of the meeting of the 17th of February 2021 have been circulated. Are there any questions uh, regarding these minutes? If not, can I have a motion to confirm these minutes? Move Councillor Baxter, seconded Councillor Pearl. I will now put the motion, all those in favour? That is carried unanimously. Three on the agenda, declarations of conflicts of interest. Does anyone have a conflict of interest in a matter being discussed at tonight's meeting? No? We'll move on then uh, to our condolence motion for this evening. Pursuant to Council's governance rules, a condolence motion has been added to tonight's agenda. And this motion is in regards to Michael Solomon Godinsky, AM. Albert Park Music Identity, Michael Godinsky, sadly passed away on Monday evening at the age of 68. Mr Godinsky formed the highly successful Australian record company Mushroom Records in 1972 at the age of 20. Through Mushroom, he signed several generations of Australian musicians and performers, ranging from Mackenzie Theory, Skyhooks, The Choir Boys, Kylie Minogue and New Zealand's Split Ends. The Mushroom Group later grew to comprise Frontier Touring, as well as taking in labels like IOU, Ivy League and Liberation Records, as well as a label boss, live music promoter and promoter of electronic dance music. Mr. Gadinsky was a music publisher, film and television producer, racehorse owner, and a passionate supporter of the St Kilda Football Club. Mr. Gadinsky worked tirelessly during the pandemic to make the case for support of the live music industry and partnered with the Victorian government on a number of initiatives designed to create opportunities for musicians to play live, virtually and in person. His focus in the months leading up to his death was on helping musicians who suffered from a lack of work during COVID and trying to ensure the opportunities were, or opportunities were provided to ensure their survival. Council would like to express its sincere condolences to Mr. Gandinsky's wife, children, grandchildren, and the many artists he has represented over his career. Mr. Gadinsky's legacy will continue to live on in the city of Port Phillip through his Albert Park headquarters and the many local musicians and venues that he championed. Councillors, I seek someone to move the motion that Council expresses its deep regret on the passing of Michael Gadinsky, offers its sincere condolences to his family, and places on record its appreciation for his service to the City of Port Phillip. Councillor Pearl and Councillor Copsey to second. Uh, would anyone, well, Councillor Pearl, would you like to speak to the motion? Councillor Copsey. I just say that it's obviously come as a huge shock and um, I think that um, the live music scene and the broader community is still reeling from the loss. It's an incredible contribution over the course of a lifetime to our culture in Australia and um, I thank the Mayor for arranging to bring this condolence motion tonight and um, fully support and endorse it and express my condolences to those who knew Mr Gidinski. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? I will briefly. I think the thing that speaks to me most profoundly, I mean, can you imagine the Australian or, or, or Victorian music scene without the energy and, um, well, 
the, the determination and perseverance and success of Michael Gadinsky and the Mushroom Group, I, I don't think we'd be quite the same place. Uh, and, and I know our, our heart and souls would not be the same without the music from those various groups. I do like what he was doing prior to his death was helping other musicians as he has an entire lifetime. We know that, the, that for the creative industries, it's been the toughest years as it's going to second year of, of most people, most artists' lives. So I thank Mr. Gadinsky for what you've brought, particularly to our city, but to the wider communi creative community. Um, and, and I am just hats off that his last acts was still contributing to the music industry he loves so much. Uh, Councillor Pell, did you want to close? All right, councillors, I put that motion. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. So now we're moving to public question time and submissions, item four on the agenda. Our meeting processes have been altered via resolution of council to hear all submissions from members of the public at the start of the meeting. And so we will now hear all public questions and public comment on the report items. All of our uh, speakers were requested to submit to speak by 4 p.m. this afternoon. And at the time of registering to speak, submitters were given the option of whether to come to the town hall and speak in person or to uh, speak via WebEx or they could have their officers read their statement on their behalf. So statements submitted by members of the public will be read in summary by an officer. Uh, so firstly, I call upon Peter Holland, speaking to item 10.1, Park Street, Street Streetscape Improvement Project, and it's the release of the draft concept design for consultation. Now, Mr. Holland, I believe you're joining us virtually. I'm well. Uh, we, could we turn up the sound a little? It's a bit hard to hear. Is that is that true for even now speaking? Yes. Could we speaking. overall? One, two, three. It's really speaking. not loud enough. Just bear with us for a moment, Mr. Holland. Is there a way of okay. increasing the volume on those speakers? Mr. Holland, could you just state your name and suburb and see how that goes? Peter Holland, St Kilda. Still very quiet. We might. What if I speak loudly? Oh, that's fantastic. Would you like to make okay. a statement? I think council can supply some proties at the end then. Great. Uh, I'm speaking for the uh, Port Phillip uh, Bicycle Users Group, the BUG, and we welcome the report. Obviously, this is a very important precinct. We're going to have to balance the interests of residents and public transport users and bikes and motor vehicles. The bug made a submission back in 2019 on the Domain Precinct Master Plan, and we will make a submission on the merits of this Park Street uh, Streetscape project, especially on the east-west link for bicycles. I just want to briefly make a general point about what's new since 2019, and of course that's COVID. Uh, people are going to be reluctant to use public transport, and we don't want people jumping into their cars instead increasing congestion and causing other problems. I draw Council's attention to the report released last month by the Joint Parliamentary Committee entitled Inquiry into the Victorian Government's Response to the COVID-19 Pandemic. I'm sure officers are aware of this, but Chapter 7 deals with transport and infrastructure and basically says bikes are an integral part of helping us reach a new normal there was a survey by Vic Health that said, and I quote, people want to walk or ride to places like work, university, school or the shops when restrictions ease, but they are concerned about their safety. And the report said that two thirds of those surveyed said they may ride for transport more if bike lanes were physically separated from the road. The recommendation of the report is that the Department of Transport prioritise investment in safe cycling infrastructure to address this increase in demand and that it work collaboratively with metropolitan councils. So I think what council is doing here with Park Street is consistent with state government policy. We're trying to put in some physically separated bike lanes. The bug welcomes the report and will make a submission on the details. I just have two questions and one is 
who would be the best officer for us to consult with? Is it one of the three senior officers uh, listed on the report or is there a junior officer who's responsible for the day-to-day -day carriage of the matter? And secondly, is it possible to get a hard copy of the SMEC report because we found it quite difficult to read the report, the details online? So thank you very much. I think Council's on the right step and I think the end will be a terrific project. Thank you, Mr Holland. I will take those questions up at, a bit later with, with officers for you. Now, I just wanted to check before we go to, because um, I can't hear it, I can hear the sound down here. Is it coming out of those top speakers? Are, are you, is everyone down there able to hear a bit better now? Yep, great, thank you. Uh, and I did want to just remind all our speakers, uh, you have three minutes to speak uh, and I will be winding you up if once we get to that point. So now I call upon George Swinburne, also speaking to item 10.1, which is the Park Street Streetscape Improvement Project. Thanks, George. If you could state your name and suburb, and then you've got your three minutes. Mayor, I was speaking on item 10.1. Yes, that's the one. That's what we're doing. Uh, I'm George Swinburne. I reside at the Hallmark Apartments, which is on the corner of uh, Park Street, St Kilda Road and Albert Road. It's my submission that this recommendation to endorse the release of the draft concept plan should be rejected by Council. The proposal has been discussed with councillors and council officers over several years and with the Honourable Martin Foley, member for Albert Park. Despite residents pointing out the basic flaws and the misconceptions about the necessity for reducing footpaths, removing parking spaces and introducing bike lanes, no logical changes have been adopted. Park Street has through traffic. It is not a favoured route by cyclists and if it is intended to have cycle paths to Lynx and Kilda Road to Murray Street, it should be in Tarak Road, Albert Road West, as included in the Shrine to Sea proposal. Two links are not necessary, and in Park Street, we'll take away the wide, significantly used footpaths and congest traffic in the precinct. Traffic surveys done during the pandemic are misleading and do not reflect normal traffic volumes. This is a through road, Park Street. The proposal is a classic example of the authorities not working together to achieve a desired outcome. The whole of Park Street needs a further rational consideration which fits in with the Anzac station construction. Honourable Martin Foley said the Well Street tram stop is in the wrong position and the bike paths cannot realistically be accommodated. He also said it hasn't been funded. Park Street changes cannot be finalised until the Metro project plans are finalised. How will traffic flow into Park Street from Domain Road? Will the 58 trams still run down to Rack Road West and stop at the Anzac Interchange and then down Park Street? Or will it run down Domain Road? There are people in the uh, uh, Metro project who say it's going to run down Domain Road. Others say, no, no, of course we're going to keep the, the to Rack Road West, which they should. But it's apparently not been determined. Also trams 5 and I think 64 to be rerouted down Park Street. We need a proper plan for through traffic and reduction of footpaths, inclusion of protected bike paths and removal of present parking is not the solution. If this proposal is adopted at great expense to ratepayers, far greater uh, expenses of ratepayers' money will be required to rectify it. Just yesterday, I came out of the Hallmark car park. It took me five minutes to get out of the, the car park and move 40 metres to turn left into Palmerston Crescent. This afternoon, my wife took 10 minutes to get from Albert Road to Park Street. The traffic has increased significantly and this proposal will, will just be a total uh, recipe for congestion. I ask the council to reject this proposal and instead of proposing a solution for a problem with cyclists that doesn't exist and will create a long-term disaster, it should cooperate with other authorities to achieve workable changes to Park Street. Thank you. Thank you. 
I call upon David McGowan speaking to item 10.1, Park Street Streetscape Improvement Project. If you could please state your uh, name and suburb and then take your three minutes, please. Good evening, Mayor and Councillors. David McGowan. I live at 368 St Kilda Road and I look out on Park Street uh, whenever I look out the window. I also should say I do enjoy riding my bike. Tonight uh, I would like to uh, put forward the following. I support wholeheartedly many parts of this project but I cannot support the creation of the bike link between St Kilda Road and Kings Way due to the very significant drawbacks that would result. It's important to understand that this section of Park Street is located in an area undergoing significant change. Seven of 22 potential development sites have planning approval, with two currently under construction. It's also important to note that it is a key link for traffic wanting to travel north on Kings Way. Five drawbacks I'd like to mention. First, loss of uh, further 23 on-street car spaces. Council surveys have shown that parking in the area is severely limited and whilst increased availability such as proposed in Bank Street is welcomed, this merely offsets the 29 spaces lost in Park Street when the super tram stop was implemented in 2018. Secondly, narrowing the footpaths for 70 metres adjacent to the tram stop is inconsistent with the master plan improvement initiative to widen footpaths and facilitate footpath trading activities. The third drawback, increased congestion, particularly during peak hours, as uh, George has previously indicated, congestion in Park Street between St Kilda Road and Kings Way causes a traffic log jam that stretches back along Wells Street to Coventry Street. This will be much worse when all developments are complete, but the loss of road space by the introduction of a bike lane will have a dramatic adverse impact by reducing traffic to a single lane for longer. Importantly, traffic turning right into Kings Way banks back to the tram stop preventing through traffic from approaching the intersection. The proposed bike link will mean substantially less vehicles will be cleared with each sequence of lights. The fourth uh, drawback, the inconsistency with Council's Integrated Transport Strategy 2018-28. The first priority in identifying bike routes is listed as ease of delivery, selecting local streets and avoiding key traffic and public transport routes. As this section of Park Street is both a key traffic route and tram corridor, including a super tram stop, how is this the preferred route for a bike link? The fifth is that there's a better alternative. I do not understand the CDM comparative assessment rankings of the four corridors that they considered. Mr McGowan, you will need to, to come to the end nor their finding of already demonstrable rider demand along Park Street. The latter comment may, result to, may relate to west of Kings Way. A broader view of the Kings Way corridor route, including opportunities prevented, sorry, presented by the Shrine to Sea project, potentially including an end of trip facility constructed on the corner of Albert Road near McRobertson Girls School, would enhance the argument for this being the best east-west crossing. The Park Street link and Kingsway might have less impediments to construction, but the negative impacts on footpaths, so traders, McGowan, pedestrian traffic flows up. and parking are huge. I ask you to defer the release of the draft concept design and request that officers properly consider the negative impacts flowing from the current design and also to more deeply investigate the merits of the Kingsway bike route via uh, back of uh, McRobbs to Albert Road. Thank you. 
Uh, I now call upon John Tabbert, uh, speaking to item 10.1, Park Street Streetscape Improvement Project. You have three minutes, sir. If you state your name and suburb, please. Turn it on, sir. Thank you, Mayor, councillors. My name is John Tabart. Firstly, thanks to the officers for the comprehensive paper and background information. It's given a really good picture of what has happened, uh, despite the extensive input from the residents in the area, um, an unerring path towards a bike route in the wrong place. Not a, we're not against bikes or bike routes, but it's fundamental that they don't impact on pedestrians or the residents living in the area. We, as the G12, I represent uh, the main precincts residents group, there's a large group of residents occupying 22 buildings in the, um, in the domain precinct, approximately 5,000 total residents, have advocated for a master plan to this precinct two for some time, two to, for five years in fact. We think it's a good idea, not just on the public space, but of the whole master plan. And certainly not with a bike route on what is now a reduced uh, arterial road with a major super stop in the centre, only two lanes of cars. The, bike route um, and, sorry, a new tram stop um, has reduced the footpath widths in the plan from six metres to three metres. No street trading. Uh, we use that footpath every day, walking pedestrians to bus route 58, walking our dogs, etc. shops and restaurants. Um, the bike route will eliminate necessary parking car spaces and drop-off zones and loading bays that have been eliminated by the, uh, the superstop. Despite no demand for a bike route in this location, it's rarely used by cyclists today, uh, existing and in future, tra future traffic will be a further constraint as a result of this plan, the bike route. The bike route principles are supposed to keep clear of main traffic routes and public transport routes. This does not. The Shrine to the Sea proposed bike route behind McRobbs, Albert Road West and Murray Street uh, is the best despite the low ranking by your assessment. The bike lobby want that route. We ask that the consultation be about the principle of the bike route location, not as well as the landscape design. It's all about putting the bike route in the right place and this is the wrong place. The assessment by SMEC should be fully explained because it doesn't add up. It ranks both Coventry Street and the Shrine to the Sea route behind Park Street, which is ridiculous given the crosses against the Park Street route. We ask that we are listened to, because we've been talking for a long time and been part of a lot of consultation, and that a conversation occurs rather than ideological direction based on bikes on routes to the detriment of local residents, pedestrian, and living amenity. Thank you very much. Thank you. I call upon Michelle Curtis speaking to item 13.1, which is the proposed extension of business parklets. If you could state your name and suburb and then please speak. Thank you. Um, Michelle Curtis from St Kilda West. Um, I'm the owner of Frankie's Top Shop on Cowderoy Street. Um, and like many hospitality businesses, was affected by COVID last year. Um, the introduction of the parklet and the support from local and state government has been amazing for my small business. Um, we utilise four parking spots on the street, uh, which allows us, we've actually built a deck because the road has a bit of a slope, so it's a very safe environment for people to sit and eat breakfast and drink coffee. Um, allows us to have 16 seats uh, spread over about seven tables. In the good old days, we could squeeze people inside like sardines, but with the, um, the restriction um, of you know, trying to keep everyone 1.5 metres apart, being able to have the deck, the parklet outside, has had a really positive impact on our business. And since we've come out of lockdown, um, we've seen a growth of about 25% in the business. So the customers, my customers love my parklet. They will come down and bombard you themselves if you were to let them. They are so keen for us to keep it. It does, we have a beautiful location 
Uh, we're in a residential street. I should have said that before, if those are not aware, right near the corner of Beaconsfield Parade. Um, and we got two amazing gum trees out the front of the business. So it's a very shaded, beautiful spot for people to sit and enjoy a coffee. Um, they're extremely safe on the parklet, not only from traffic, but also from any potential um, virus. Um, all my customers love it. I cannot tell you how much they just, every day someone says, can you keep it? Will you be able to keep it? Um, and that just says so much for us. I think as we head into the cooler weather as well, um, it would be nice to know if we were able to keep the parklets, if it, we had a definite time on that, so that we can maybe prepare to make them a little bit warmer over the winter months. So whether it was some wind barriers or do something else, whether it was invest, worth investing in that infrastructure. Um, yeah, again, thank you. It has been an absolute amazing asset for my business and I hope that you will agree to let them stay for a bit longer. Um, Michelle, I just had a request from Councillor Pearl to ask a question, if that's okay. Council came to approval very quickly. Without it, we would have been pretty close to the wall. Uh, I think we did a pretty good job. We tried to bring a little bit of Positano and the Malfi Coast to South Melbourne. I think we pulled that off. Customers have been very happy. Our revenue's been 25% up. 2020 was a terrible year. I think hospitality was uh, decimated. I don't think there's any, besides airline industry, I think hospitality was the worst hit. I think without the parklets, in a nutshell, we'd all be in a different position. So um, I strongly, strongly urge you all to consider not only extending the parklets beyond April, beyond December, but coming to a commercial arrangement with uh, lot holders and operators that uh, reimburse the council funds that you're losing on car parking. I think I read it was something like 119 grand, and there are 197 parklets. That doesn't seem very much across 197 parklets. The maths are pretty simple. Um, so, Marcus, to answer your question you asked earlier, I think that will uh, be something we would support, um, the approximate number. So, um, yeah, I want to, on record, that without it, we would have been all stuffed. So, thanks very much and, and consider extending it. Thank you. Thanks, Salvatore. I call upon Stephen Whitaker speaking to item 13.1 as well. Stephen, if you could state your name and suburb, then. Uh, Stephen Whitaker, Elwood. Uh, yes, I'm the owner of the King of Tonga Bar in Tennyson Street. I've been there for approximately 18 and a half years. I've uh, seen the evolution of that tiny shopping strip, and it's always been a particular quiet uh, shopping strip, very much like every other suburban little shopping strip in, uh, in Victoria. Come the advent of COVID, it's all changed. And as my, uh, the previous speaker I concur with, we would have gone to the wall had we not had the parklets. But there is an inadvertent consequence of the parklets, and that is that it's now created a community hub, a village, a place where people could come and meet, congregate. 
All of a sudden, there is a little touch of Europe in Tennyson Street, Elwood, despite the fact I own a bar called the King of Tonga. Uh, so I'd like to actually congratulate the council on their forward thinking. I think it saved Tennyson Street, and Tennyson Street is now a great success. Thank you, Stephen. I call upon Daniel Clarici uh, speaking to item 13.1. Sir, if you could state your name and suburb, and then take it away. Oh, we just need to press that. Is that working now? Marvellous. Um, my name is Daniel. I am from South Bank, but I own Sister of Soul on Ackland Street in St Kilda. Um, I just want to say thank you to the council again for, much like the previous speakers, about the support you've shown us to help offset the impact of COVID has, the, the impact that COVID has had on our business. Um, what I'd like to say though, in particular to our parklet, um, is that it's not just something that benefits us as a business to offset what has happened. We work collaboratively with the council to create something that also helped the community, both from a pedestrian safety point um, additional bike parking for uh, push bikes so people can park their bikes in the heart of, the, of Ackland Street, as well as shortening the footpath, sorry, shortening the space that it takes to walk from one side of Shakespeare Grove to the other. So there's been a multitude of benefits by having that parklet there and working with council on this measure. Um, the other thing that um, those car parks that we occupy, there's five cars, we occupy I think four out of the five that are there, and all of those car spots are free car spaces. Three of those are one hour car spaces, and two of those are 15 minutes. They, and prior to all this, they were never monitored by um, the parking inspectors. I know this because I park my car there all day. It was my personal car park, and I never got a fine. So I've actually shot myself in the foot by having the parklet there. Um, but that aside, this measure is something that has truly benefited us and I think the community as a whole. Our one in particular, we've gone out of our way to make a statement that that corner, that intersection, which is the major corridor between Ackland Street and the beach, can be really beautified, preferably something more on a permanent basis, but this works just as well. Um, extending it beyond April, to me, is a no-brainer. Extending it beyond December is a no-brainer. Um, for us to pay a fee to maintain that space doesn't bother us in the slightest. In fact, it's a net benefit to the council for us to pay a fee because you probably get more income out of us paying fees than you would from parking fines from those, you know, bad people. Um, so to my mind, by giving us the surety that we can continue trading out of that space allows us to continue to reinvest in that space. We want to make it as all weather as possible. And if you give us that certainty, that will certainly give us the confidence that we can invest money to ensure that we can continue to have a good, strong team of people and allow people to explore vegan food on a much more wider basis. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I call upon Daniel Watson speaking to item 13.1, proposed extension of business parklets. Daniel, if you could state your name again and, uh, and your suburb, please. I'll just turn it off. Daniel Watson, Elwood. Um, I'm from the Tennyson Street Village. I'm Steve's neighbour. I'm a pup. I've only been here about seven years. But I always felt the community, it could have done with a small shopping strip with a parklet, basically. Unfortunately, it came at bad circumstances, but... It's just great for the community. I came to the community to build the community, and this just encapsulates that. The other good thing about us, for example, on Tennyson Street, we're sort of dual using our space, so it's not taking up any more car spaces. I use it during the day, and Steve's Bar uses it during the evening. So it's not taking up more spaces and creating more hassle for people that need car spaces. So I'm all for it. All the other speakers have pretty much said anything I was going to say, so well done. Thanks very much. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, I now call upon Stephen Boyle speaking to item 13.1, proposed extension of business parklets. 
Name and suburb, sir. Just pop that on. Is that on? Yeah. I'm Steve Boyle from Johnny's Elwood Coffee Roasters. Um, a brief history about myself. I've been in the industry for 30 years um, in a variety of situations in hospitality, from fine dining to large format venues that hold over a thousand people. I've worked with Heritage Victoria. I've worked with a Good Food Guide. I've worked with Bell Magazine. I'm very much entrenched in the industry. I'm a lifer. I believe in what I'm doing, and I'm passionate about how I apply myself every day, not only to my business, but to my community and to my young son called Johnny. Furthermore, the pressure on hospitality is unprecedented beyond your wildest imagination, and I implore you and congratulate you on supporting the young people out there trying to employ other people, trying to connect a community, um, and I believe there's going to be a very, very strong push from my clientele, which is in the thousands, to encourage council to connect the community. That withstanding, we need to talk to the chemists, we need to talk to the, to the business, to the, to the bank, we need to talk to the fruit and veg, because they are part of the community too. So an encouragement there, keep doing what you're doing, Increasing communication, and we're going to have a very great result in the coming years. Thanks very much. Thank you, Stephen. I call upon Michael Knight speaking to item 13.1, proposed extension of business parklets. Uh, Mayor, councillors, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I'm very pleased to hear the traders. <coughs> Um, extolling the benefits of the parklets because I think that they have been um, a really magnificent part of our community. Oh, sorry, I, I live at, in Alfred Square, St Kilda, um, at number one. In particular, um, the area through Elwood, I think, um, does remind me and is very reminiscent of sort of a European um, type environment. My question of the council, though, um, has a, a slightly more negative um, aspect. One of the businesses which has taken advantage of the Council's current policy, um, which occupies um, a fair chunk of the beachfront down at um, West Beach. And it's come to my attention that whilst the Council have been very gracious um, in providing them additional space uh, to run their business, they are charging a fee of $40 to occupy the parklet. Now, I'm not sure whether that is happening in, with any other businesses um, in the city of Port Phillip, but certainly at West Beach Bathers Pavilion, if you want to sit or occupy any part of the additional area which has been granted to that business by the council, you have to pay $40 to do so. Now, this comes down to the commercial aspect of these parklets. Um, I don't expect that in the current climate, the um, owners of these businesses should be encumbered with anything, to be, in my opinion, but if, if it were to be something that it should be um, a small amount, not a commercial rent, but a small amount. But for the traders who are currently occupying this space free of charge, to be charging the residents of the city of Port Phillip to use it is, in my opinion, unacceptable. So my question for the council is, does the council have a policy in relation to this activity? If so, what is it? And if not, I think that businesses should be made aware that this type of action is unacceptable. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Michael. Uh, a councillor may take that up later uh, this evening. I call upon Leslie Roth speaking to item 13.1. If you could state your name, sir, and suburb, and then you've got three minutes. Uh, good evening. My name is Leslie Roth. I'm a pharmacist and have been trading in Ormond Road, Elwood for nearly 50 years. I want to talk against the parklets. Ormond Road shopping strip is a beautiful strip with a good mix of shops and retailers, and there has not been an empty shop for decades. 
The biggest problem has always been the lack of car parking spaces. <clears throat> Along came COVID, trading was very difficult. But in November 2020, Daniel Andrews eased restrictions and instructed council to build these parklets because it's a worldwide phenomenon. This does not mean it's right for everyone, especially in Ormond Road shopping strip. <clears throat> Literally overnight, business dropped. Now all these hospitality industries are wrapped in the parklets, but all the other retailers find it a disaster. They are totally underutilised and a waste of resources. And I don't understand why the Port Phillip Council is pushing for the parklets so vigorously. Save us money and give us a rate cut. Now, parklets are empty if it's too hot, too cold or rainy. Across the road from me is Dandelion. It's a night restaurant. Parklet is empty all day. Plain Sailing, which is on my right, has a large footpath outdoor area. Why a parklet? It's empty all afternoon. Combi was always a takeaway cafe. The parklet is empty all afternoon. Milton Wine Bar is not open until night and has an outdoor area and an indoor area. Jimmy Jams has a large indoor area and a large outdoor area out back. Why the need for parklets? I don't understand. The parklets are a disaster for the strip as car parking is worse than ever. Customers are down, car traffic is down, mum used to come and shop after school, but no more. Now my question is, who gave written consent for these parklets in Ormond Road? Because I certainly wasn't asked, consulted, told about them or anything. And if there aren't any, then they're illegal and they should be removed immediately. Save the Ormond Road shopping centre, Think of the other retailers, not just the hospitality industry, and give us more parking, not less. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I call upon Chris Fort speaking to item 13.1. Is Chris here or online? No, we might move on to... No. Uh, so we've received a further four submissions to be read out on behalf of members of the public. So I'll call the name of each member, call out the name of each member of the public and refer to the Manager of Governance and Organisational Performance to read a summary of the submissions. So uh, Rachel, uh, the first one is from Adrian Jackson. Through you, Mayor. Mr Jackson's question reads, with the demise of Facebook within Australia, is there scope to redeploy some of council staff? Thank you. Uh, could, I believe, Carly Bennett's, you're going to respond to Mr Jackson's question. Through you, Mayor, Council uses a range of digital platforms and social media to communicate and engage with its community and ensures that it has staff with the relevant skills and capabilities to engage across these platforms. Thank you. Uh, we've got another few questions from Adrian Jackson. Rachel? Thank you. Through you, Mayor, Mr Jackson's question reads, why is a proposed plaza in front of ANAM, as mentioned at Council's meeting on the 17th of February 21, still on Council's wish list based on a decade-old proposal? The grassed area at the front is picturesque and useful to dozens of ANAM staff as it already is. Why is Council wanting to waste more ratepayers' funds on this costly white elephant project? Is Council aware that a costly stonework plaza may be dug up for works as Fitzroy Street stonework is currently being dug up, as advised by Councillor Bond at the Council meeting on the 17th of February 21? And are councillors aware that the proposed Annan Plaza area is a space that few will want to use if it is covered in stonework, which will also radiate heat on onto users. Uh, Kylie Bennett. 
Through you, Mayor, the Emerald Hill Master Plan 2012 and Vision 2011 nominates a long-standing aspiration by the local community to utilise the front of the South Melbourne Town Hall for community and art events. In 2013, Council adopted a precinct design for the forecourt, which includes the closure of the service lane. This initiative is currently unfunded and not scheduled for delivery. Early consultation commences this month on the South Melbourne Structure Plan. This plan will take a long-term view of the future of South Melbourne, including its public realm. Community members are invited to participate and share their aspirations for South Melbourne through this process. And another one from Adrian Jackson. Thank you. Through you, Mayor, Mr Jackson's question reads, who is paying for the renovations, repairs to the Lease Annam building, the former South Melbourne Town Hall? What is the project cost of this work? Is this work covered by insurance? If Annam does not return to South Melbourne, is consideration being given to, the, to turn the building into a shopping precinct with market price rental income, like what has been done to the former Melbourne GPO a few decades ago? And finally, is Council aware that this would complement the nearby South Melbourne market too? Uh, Chris Carroll. Uh, through you, Mayor, given that it's such a multifaceted question, I'll take it on notice. Uh, there's a, an, um, I, an, an, sorry, a submission from Alexander Gadab on item 13.1. Uh, Rachel? Thank you. Through you, Mayor. Uh, Mr Gadab's statement reads, As a local business owner, I am in full support of an extension on the Business Parklet Initiative in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. This initiative has made a significant contribution to the financial recovery of my own and many other businesses in the municipality and continues to do so. It is vital that the Business Parklet Initiative extension is enacted as we continue to chip away at recouping the massive revenue losses during the past three lockdowns. And one more from Dominique Bolger, also on 13.1. Through you, Mayor. Um, our question of 13 years is... is oh, sorry. Our restaurant on th of 13 years is on Cardigan Place in Albert Park Village. Pre-COVID... We were a 40-seater restaurant. We can now seat 28 indoors. Our parklet area has been fantastic for us and our small strip. The Port Phillip Council granted us 10 metres uh, with three non-metered parking spaces, of which we took seven metres, uh, comprising of two uh, parking spaces. We had a pine deck built from the footpath edge over the wide gutter and over the parking spaces. The feedback from customers and passers-by has been phenomenal. People have genuinely admired it and requested the details of who built it. Before this, we had four tables squashed on a slanty pavement, so this is a real treat for everyone. If we are able to keep the deck going into the winter months, we'll obviously need to spend some money weatherproofing it and getting more heaters, which we're willing to do, to make sure we're able to use the deck to its full advantage. In relation to parking, we are fortunate enough to be in a village where most are able to walk to the shops and there is ample parking around. We feel removing the parklets in April is way too soon. We need to get through the winter period and see how we all get on. The community are loving these spaces, and if we can't travel yet, people are enjoying the Euro European vibe. Many, many thanks for the consideration. Thank you. So that's the last of our speakers. Uh, we'll now move on to item five, which is councillor question time. Councillors, do you have any questions for the officers? Councillor Pearl. Two quick ones, if I may, Madam Mayor. Uh, first one is in relation to a small number of um, resident complaints I've been getting for some time, which I've never raised in this meeting, but I looked at my list and thought I should pull this one out, but happy for the take it on notice. This is regarding uh, particularly concrete trucks on Dorker Street, South Melbourne, coming off Pickle Street to service the um, metro. There's been a number of spills of which I think uh, Council did some enforcement works on uh, a year or two ago. Um, regarding trucks uh, accidentally or illegally dumping concrete on the road as they came around that corner. But there's a large number of trucks that are using Dorker Street. Um, Council, as is my understanding, has met with the uh, Cross Yarra Partnership to resolve the truck route issue. 
um, and some progress was made, but it's now returned to be a continuing issue. Just wondering if uh, officers could report back on notice, perhaps if they've considered any measures such as uh, no, no truck entering signs into Dorcas Street on the corner of Pickle Street as they come up around that small corner there um, to encourage trucks to go down Pickle Street to Bay Street and then along the uh, pre-existing commercial um, roadways. Uh, just wondering if you could report back and see if there's any developments um, to see if we can do further improvements for residents living along Dorcas Street, South Melbourne. Through you, Mayor, um, thank you for notifying um, council officers of the concerns of residents and I'll take that on notice and follow up the concerns and, and provide a response. Thank you. Uh, what's your second question, Councillor Pearl? Thank you, uh, Lily, and thank you, Madam Mayor. The second question is just relation into to MSEC, MSAC or Melbourne Sports... What, it, um, what No, what are they called now? Melbourne... No, that's MSAC. But anyway, MSAC's part of a bigger group called something else now. I can't remember what it's called. It's the Lakeside Oval um, and MSAC and something else combined. But I just wanted to get an update on... Um, yeah, I just wanted to get an update on Council's relationship with that association. So there's a number of residents saying that MSAC in particular is now becoming much more elite sport focused and Council had a board position so far as I can recall until about 2015, 2016... Um, on MSAC to ensure that uh, our community was consulted on what was going on with MSAC and also uh, their views and opinions were held at the M MSAC board. So I just wanted to see what level of communication and dialogue we're having with the governing authority of MSAC and um, what are we doing to represent community views at that facility? Uh, I believe it's Tony Keenan who may take that on notice. We'll find out. Uh, through you, Mayor, yeah, you're correct, Councillor Pearl. I think from memory it was a 20-year agreement that we had a board position and that's expired, that term. There are no formal arrangements. Uh, I've met a couple of times with the CEO uh, about um, potential partnerships in relation to our youth service, but the rest of that question I'd need to take on notice and get back to you. Councillor Copsey. I just take up the question that was raised um, during submissions earlier regarding um, charging for access to parklets, whether councillors or uh, officers are aware of this. Um, and there was, as part of that question, a query about whether there's a policy on this, if officers could just um, relay how that will be dealt with. Kylie Bennett's. Uh, through you, Mayor, with respect to um, the reference to charging, um, we'll need to take that element on notice. Um, but in terms of a policy, uh, on the Council's website, there is a business parklet guidelines, which provides uh, guidance to traders, communities, as well as officers on the requirements with respect to um, business parklets. What I would say is that um, that document was prepared quickly to support businesses and community safely during the COVID safe period uh, and the paper that you'll consider a bit later tonight um, makes reference to a longer term policy um, which we could perhaps talk more to when we get to that agenda item. Are there any other councillor questions? We'll move on to the ceiling schedule which we also have no um, items for that so on to petition and joint letters which we have none for a change. So let's go to the main body of the, um, of the meeting, which is the presentation of reports. So we're going to report 8.1, which is the presenta presentation of the CEO report, which is issue 72. Are there any questions for the officers, councillors? Councillor Pearl. Just wondering if the CEO can give some commentary on the future of this report. Obviously, it, it, it's a good report and it's voluminous in its nature, but I'm just wondering... Uh, how this will evolve with the new council plan when it comes in and perhaps if we can make it slightly more concise um, without losing the materiality of the information that sits within the report. Uh, that's the first question. And then also just to get an indication of just how much resources are, are required by council to produce this report. Uh, through you, Mayor, and thank you for the question, 
Councillor Pearl. Um, through the engagement process, um, which we held last Saturday, it was clear that the community, uh, we're waiting for the report on that, it was clear the community wanted clear outcome reporting. Um, and also councillors have indicated to us in our internal workshops um, that there is a need to have really useful outcome data at a city council and service level that can inform decision making. And over time, this report has grown in volume from its original uh, con uh, inception. And so we're working uh, closely as part of the council plan process to um, review the measures at a high level in the council plan with the council and they'll go out um, as part of the engagement in April for the community to comment on. Um, and they will, will, and then we will at the same time look to reduce a lot of these service level and project level measures so they are useful to inform decision making and I think that's been clear from both the council and the community. In terms of your second question, there are significant resources involved in collecting data and so we need to make sure they're value for money and we only collect data and report on uh, the data and, and indicators that are useful for both council and their decision making and inform the community um, in terms of the achievement of the council plan, the outcomes at a city level and at a service level. Are there, are there any more uh, questions of the officers on this report, the CEO report? Councillors, we have an officer's recommendation. Would someone like to move this or something different? Councillor Pearl, seconded by Councillor Copsey. Councillor Pearl, would you like to speak to the motion? Councillor Copsey, no? Uh, with, are there any other councillors who would like to speak to the motion? Councillor Pearl, would you like to close? Uh, so I will now put that to the vote. All those in favour? That is carried unanimously. Moving on to item 9.1, which is our fitness training policy. Councillors, are there any questions of the officers in relation to this report? Uh, I have a question. I note that um, we have a very low rate of charging on a yearly basis for our personal trainers to use public open space and that it is a state government set. Uh, I was just interested to find out, is with the negotiations we're having, does there seem to be an appetite to be a more reflective fee for the amount of time that they spend using our public space for commercial use? Uh, through you, Mayor, I'd defer to David Nankervis, who's online, to respond to that. D David Nankervis? Through you. Sorry, through you, Mayor. I will we can't quite hear you, yeah. David. Could you, like, yell at, <laughs> at the, your computer? Sorry, is that... Are we getting better? That's a lot better. A bit more volume? You. That's a lot better. I'm happy to refer to Kiara McDonald uh, on this oh, topic. Kiara. Kiara, Am I going to Kiara McDonald? Are you online, Kiara? Yes. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, there definitely is an appetite um, to enter into these negotiations and conversations with the state government um, in relation to the review of that current um, DELT policy that is in place. Um, therefore, we will continue to be having those conversations with the appropriate departments um, as the time goes on. Um, through COVID, those conversations were put on hold, which was a state government decision. Um, but we have been told um, that they will be kicking off again um, in the coming months. So we will be able to take on those negotiations to have a fair and equitable um, charging policy across the board. Thank you. Are there any other questions for officers? Uh, councillors, we have an officer's recommendation. Uh, would someone like to move this? Uh, Councillor Bond or something different? Um, do we not have a alternate officer's recommendation? Apologies. Let me just go to my... It may be the one that I've turned over to. Yes, okay, so we do have an alt. Would you like to take charge of that one, Councillor Bond, and read out um, the alt? Yes, I will move the alternate officer's recommendation and just a change to 3.2 which uh, notes that the existing sites where fitness trainers can operate have changed to specifically define the permitted training zones and and site exclusions which is a, a, just a slight adjustment on the original wording of the the motion for item 3.2 
Do I have a seconder for this alt-rec, Councillor Martin? Councillor Bond, would you like to speak to this? Um, not a lot to really say about this, not that I utilise this particular um, service in Port Phillip all that often, or as often as I probably should. <laughs> but who knows what happened in the future, I may be able to take advantage of this new policy. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Martin. Very briefly, unlike Councillor Bond, I have been around some of our personal training sites just to watch what's happening and we really need to make sure they're clearly defined. It's going to be much easier for passers-by to know exactly what's going on and for council officers to enforce. So I thank Councillor Bond for proposing this amendment. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? I will briefly. Um, I am really happy for our municipality to work on getting fit and healthy. However, it is public space and there are a lot of personal trainers and that obviously is probably more reflected during COVID, but we have a lot of people working out of our various public spaces and I do think that the, the fee needs to reflect a little more of, of that use of our public space, um, but happy to see everyone getting so fit and active. Councillor Bond. Um, just to clarify a point. Uh, Councillor Martin made this as an alternate officer's recommendation, not my alternate recommendation. Sorry, an alternative officer's recommendation. Uh, I will put that motion to the vote. All those in favour? That is carried unanimously. Uh, now the item we're considering is 10.1, which is the Park Street... It's very hard to say Park Street Streetscape Improvement Project, uh, release of the draft concept designed for consultation. Are there questions of the officers? I imagine there will be in relation to this report. I have some questions. Oh, Councillor, no, you go first. Councillor Consolo. Thank you. Uh, for the officers, what are the implications to the design if we look at retaining parking for uses such as loading zones on Park Street? Uh, Brian T. Uh, through you, Mayor. Uh, if we uh, look at um, changing the design to incorporate um, a loading zone on Park Street, um, we'd, have, we'd redesign it. Uh, the major impacts would be, we'd imagine moving the bike uh, corridor onto the pavement so you'd lose um, the um, space on the pavement. Um, we would, uh, in doing so, we, this, we would also uh, move existing trees and some of the proposed new trees that would go along um, that corridor. Um, and in some areas, uh, particularly adjacent to the tram stop, we just wouldn't be able to do it. Um, so there would be limited areas where we could do that. Can I ask um, Rebecca and team, can we, the sound seems really quiet tonight and it may just be me, but is it possible just to lift everyone, these big voices or lift the volume a little bit? I'm sorry if it's just me, just having trouble hearing. Uh, are, are there any more questions, uh, Councillor Martin? Through you, Madam Mayor. Um, Council officers, in the course of the consultation that uh, has been proposed, is it possible to broaden that consultation so many of the issues that were brought up by some of the speakers earlier can be addressed in part of that consultation? Brian T. Um, uh, through you, Mayor, the uh, consultation will be the consultation will be um, um, broad in terms of the. Um, range of people that we talk to um, and the responses that we receive will all be taken into account and considered. So the, the issues that were identified tonight are certainly in the main the very sorts of issues that we anticipate will come up. Um, the process would be we will then summarise those, provide that into a report to um, councillors and um, for people who do participate we will um, advise them of their opportunity to come to this to, to the subsequent meeting to provide those views directly. Uh, Councillor Consolo. Thank you, Madam Mayor. If we were to go through this consultation and we receive a lot of feedback that says we need to make changes and then go back through a design, do we start looking at a time frame that's unreasonable for any state funding or things that we're hope are um, planning on receiving? Brian. Um, thank you. Um, through you, Mayor, the timeline that we've got uh, requires us to complete um, 
the not just the corridor, but the important elements around the streetscape design prior to the Park Street link, tram link, uh, which is due for construction in 2024. Our current timeline has construction completing um, in the financial year 22-23. So there is um, a buffer, not a significant buffer, but there is a buffer, there is some flexibility in our timelines. Uh, Peter just wants to ask a question or clarify. Sorry, the, in answering Council, through you, Mayor, in answering Councillor Consolo's question, can I just refer to 6.3 of the report, which says um, that uh, seeking an alternative alignment or deferring the, the, the Park Street streetscape would trigger a, rev a review of the 1.2? I think that's relevant to Councillor Consolo's question. Could you address that, please, Brian? Uh, certainly. Um, the um, Council has a uh, commitment from the state um, to provide um, 1.2 million, of which we spent 200,000 uh, in design. Um, any, uh, it's a drawdown um, commitment, so any changes, any changes to the um, timelines um, will need to be uh, will need to be, will need will require um, RPV agreement, um, and they are running on on, on a very tight uh, timeline. Are there further questions? I've I've got a couple, if I may. Uh, so read the consultation that we are considering tonight. It seems to me that it's quite. Uh, an extensive number of residents. So it's, it's the buildings around there, but also some of the surrounding streets. So I guess I'm just interested, will we capture more people than perhaps we've heard from in previous consultations, uh, as well as the, the people that are directly on Park Street, but some of the side streets? Um, thank you, uh, Mayor, for uh, the question. Um, the engagement that we propose will be um, extensive. Uh, we anticipate mailing um, information to some 4,500 to 5,000 um, properties, um, not just on Park Street but surrounds. Effectively, we've got a two um, city block um, buffer that we're engaging with. So we'll be, um, uh, that mail out will go to uh, um, the area which is bound by St Kilda Road. Um, Albert Road, Kingsway, Palmerston Crescent, Raglan Street, Clarendon Street and Dorcas Street in order to capture um, as much information, uh, in order to capture as many people who may be affected. Uh, we will then, in, there'll be, uh, in addition, uh, there'll be a number of uh, drop-in um, uh, sessions so that interested people can um, obtain further information um, as well as the um, surveys on the council website. Uh, can I also ask, uh, is part of our um, consultation going to talk to the owners' corps in all of these buildings? Because I do think, I, I wonder if they're part of the solution, like for tradies and drop-offs and deliveries. I know that it's a difficult thing, but I don't think it's just council that can solve this this challenge. So I wondered, is our owners' corporations on our list to consult with so that they can be part of the solution? Um, thank you, uh, Mayor. So owners' uh, corporations will be um, uh, will have a effectively a, a dual role. Um, they will be captured in terms of the initial mail-out that goes out, um, but equally if issues are raised around access, around parking, um, around uh, drop-offs, uh, you know, the capacity to, for, for removalists, uh, it might be that that's an opportunity to talk to those owner corps about utilising other existing internal spaces to provide um, a way forward so that when we come back uh, to council, we'll have identified any of the concerns that have been raised by the community, um, but we will also, um, um, through, the, through discussions with various parties, perhaps find um, ways forward. I have one other question, or is there another councillor that would like to ask one now? Okay, I'll ask it. What are our legal obligations as a council around black spots? Um, you know, we, we've identified this, that there have been a number of accidents. I guess I'm curious, it's hard to know where is our legal if we were to not put in a bike path. And I mean, not that you can, you can um, 
de-risk everything. But I guess I'm just interested, where does that lie in this conversation? It may not be one you can answer. I mean, it's just sort of something that's occurred to me. Um, thank you, Mayor. It, it is something I might um, need to take on notice. Councillor Pearl. Thanks, Madam Mayor. My question is in relation to one of the prioritisation of projects that was brought up by, um, I think it was Mr Swinburne. Apologies if it wasn't Mr Swinburne, which I think is a fair and valid point. How is Park Street ranked ahead of Kerford Road, if, if that's correct, based on the fact that Kerford Road is um, known and publicised as the most dangerous road in the city of Port Phillip in terms of project ranking? Uh, is it correct that this project is ranked ahead of that, for example? Uh, and if that is the case, why is that the case? Um, I think that through you, uh, Mayor, uh, Kerfoot Road um, is, um, it's difficult to measure these things, the, the, the ranking process, that the prioritisation process uh, involved a number of factors, including uh, crashes, uh, including uh, utilisation, uh, including the linkage um, from you know A to B, um, and um, uh, I'm trying to think of the others, but there were a number of factors. So it may be that Kerford Road has a higher ranking because it's got a higher um, crash rate uh, than Park Street, um, but it might be that Park Street has got a higher rating because of its ability to be delivered. That was the other factor, um, as well as the impact. The, so, sorry, the ability to be delivered. A loss of parking um, were the other factors that the prioritisation um, categorised uh, that, that led to the rankings. Um, if I could add to that, yes, yes, Mayor. Ms. Rosick. Um just to pick up that they're both corridors have been identified in Council's Move Connect Live. Both have black spot safety issues. The Kerford Road has will be picked up as part of Shrine to Sea project. Um, state government projects so we are officers are working with the state government on identifying um, an improvement to that corridor which will consider bicycle safety and um, Park Street uh, bike corridor is also as you know in Move Connect Live and um, was uh, we have received funding from IPV for that corridor um, and um, through council's advocacy thank you Councillor Pearl Thanks very much, Madam Mayor. I went back and reviewed the report for Kerford Road when we were considering government funding for Kerford Road, which clearly stated that that was the number one uh, project at the time. So clearly Park Street has now superseded Kerford Road uh, in terms of safety initiatives and our priority. So what has caused the change in priority in two and a half years based on Kerford Road, Albert Road being um, the number one priority to now in terms of infrastructure investment along these lines to now Park Street being the number one priority. What's changed? Count, uh, Lily? Uh, through you, Mayor. Um, it, nothing's changed. Um, the, the issue is that we have two different corridors that are being facilitated through different processes. So it's about timing. It's not about an opportunity. Um, we are... Uh, leveraging off the state government project to address the safety concerns on Kerford Road and um, off the Anzac Station RPV project for addressing Park Street safety concerns. I, uh, I note Council Pearl's comment, they're just, it's all about timing, it's not about that one is um, being reprioritised over another. Council Pearl? Just so I can clarify, and I quote, you're saying the basis is timing and opportunity as opposed to safety? Uh, it, just to clarify, they are both corridors that have safety concerns. Um, tonight, Council's considering the Park Street corridor, but Kerford Road is being progressed as well. It's just going to take a longer time frame to identify an appropriate solution. So apologies for any misunderstanding. Are there further questions, councillors? Councillor Bond. Um, I'd like to move an alternate recommendation. Uh, are there any further questions first, though, before we go to that? 
I, I had a question too. If we were not to go out to consultation um, on this one uh, to consider this design, is there reputational damage or I guess it's what Councillor Consolo asked before, would we have to return money uh, to the state government and does it have an effect on where we're at given they have contributed to some things already? Um, two part uh, question through you Mayor. Um, we do not have to return funding. Um, the timelines that we've discussed uh, that are set out in the report are timelines that we've provided to RPV. So they are timelines that RPV um, uh, have um, uh, worked with us on and accept that they will work for the project. So um, we would have to go back um, and review those with RPV. Um, just to add to that, Madam Mayor, if that's okay, is that um, our, the, the officer discussion has been that if council chose not to proceed with this project, um, that they would they would potentially use that money for a different purpose. So we, we may risk the loss of the contribution the, the, that we haven't expended to date. Through, through you, Mayor, I think it's clear if you don't go to consultation, there will be some timing risks, some external funding risk, uh, and depending on uh, what you come back with um, in, term, in terms of your decision tonight and how you proceed, there may be some additional risks which uh, would depend on some of the elements of the demand of the, the, any further design um, or indeed, but it's in council's remit too, to, to stop the project if they wish. I have another question. Given there has been a lot of time and energy going into this, on this particular strip, is it really feasible to, I mean, we've, we've added in loading bays in various, you know, and extra pass parking and are not convenient at all, I understand, but is it feasible um, to do it any other way? Like this, I mean, I know there's people talking about or in, in, interested in other other options, but this is probably, would you think that the way that it's been considered is, is one of the, the the only way that it could be designed to include a bike path? Or is there, re, uh, is there room for redesign? I don't uh, really know uh, what I'm asking. Through you, Madam Mayor, I'm going to ask Brian T to answer a little bit, but um, uh, we would have to take that on notice. It would depend on the requirements of any redesign that Council asked us uh, to undertake and we would need to check the feasibility and, and there would be certain standards and things that we'd need to address in any design. Do you want to add anything else, uh, Brian? Um, just to um, the um, constraints we've got in time we've identified, um, but we do have significant constraints also in terms of the available space um, and the cost. So uh, any redesign that um, require the removal of tram poles and other infrastructure uh, would be significantly expensive. So just um, I'd, I'd add that into the uh, mix as well as the timing and the limited space that we do have to design. And one last question for me, I hope. Uh, if we, you know, if there was consideration that there was discussion that it's a bike path on the wrong street, if you were to move it to Albert Road, would we not come up against exactly a very similar set of issues with parking and loading zones, given that so much has already been removed from there? I mean, is it in this area all bike paths will have similar challenges? I think the um, bike paths, without having a specific bike path to comment on, um, generally there are similar challenges. I, I think the big difference would be that um, RPV have indicated that their, their funding is um, for the delivery of this project. Councillor Sirikov. Um, I'm just wanting to know if I've read the draft correctly. Um, where are there, we will be going out, we will be doing consulting with the uh, a community, um, anyway, will be will there will be constant consultation period, um, and in that consultation, there are questions asking the community um, if they want to retain um, loading bays in Park Street. 
So um, isn't this part of the whole plan? I'm just wondering if this is the whole intention of what we're doing with the communi community. Uh, Brian T. John Bartell. Through you, Mayor. Um, in terms of the proposed consultation, the questions relate to the four proposed parking spaces to be retained on Park Street um, and the type of parking controls um, that are intended to be applied to those. So that's the current focus of the consultation and the questions involved therein. All right, any more questions or we'll go to the old rec? Yep. Uh, I'm happy to move an alternate motion. Okay, do you want to yep. up on the screen? Should be up on the screen. Um, the council request officers to redesign the Park Street streetscape improvement project to provide loading bays on Park Street within the vicinity of commercial premises and residential buildings located on Park Street. Request officers to bring the revised design to a future council meeting for endorsement prior to proceeding to community consultation. Notes there will be an additional cost for the redesign adding to the total project cost. Notes that in the event it is not possible to achieve a redesign outcomes of 3.1 that officers will bring back a further report to council at the earliest opportunity. And 3.5 requests officers to repurpose existing car parks on Bank Street to provide up to 30 parking spaces as soon as possible and bring forward $70,000 from funding from the 22-23, I presume that means budget or financial year, to complete these work. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Pearl. Councillor Bond, would you like to speak to your old rep? Uh, yes, I would. Um, for those who have listen to many council meetings over the years, especially members of the G12, you would have heard me speak endlessly about um, the need for loading zones and visitor parking to be a, a mandatory requirement in any new development um, in, in many areas of Port Phillip, in particular Fisherman's Bend and this particular area, St Kilda Road and the Domain Precinct. And one of the reasons I've argued for that so strongly is because all these buildings need to have the ability to cater for their own residents and their own uh, residents moving in and out and all the tradespeople that will visit these buildings which have 200 and something apartments in them. And that's likely to be tradespeople every day. It's likely to be people moving in and out a couple of times a week. And that is a, a large amount of... Um, vans that will park in those loading bays if they had them. I haven't always been successful in getting those included in buildings or appropriate loading bays included in buildings. And one of the reasons I received a bit of pushback was that um, response, response from uh, officers during these planning meetings over the years has been that there's, there's loading bays on the streets in all of, all of these areas. I know in this particular area there are a, a couple of buildings already built, one in particular 52 Park Street. It was built and approved. It's 200 and something apartments. I think it's 20 storeys. It goes all the way to Bank Street at the back. It's got a tiny little car park entrance and it doesn't have a loading bay and it's got no visitor parking. So that building that he's built, it's not a, a future building, it is built, it's there, requires all of its tradespeople and all of its loading bays and delivery vans to utilise the beyond street parking in that particular area. We heard from one of our, our speakers tonight, Mr McGowan, that there's 20 or so development sites in this Park Street area. There's eight currently have permits, there's two under construction and as I mentioned there's, I know of one that's, and I think there's a couple others completed without loading bays and visitor parking. All of that means that Loading bays and visitor parking to these buildings is critically important to how those buildings will function. And while it's too late to retrospectively implement loading bays in those buildings, we certainly should make sure that any future building in, in this location has its own loading bays, has its own visitor parking, and we stop giving waivers to that. That's a separate issue to what we're looking at here tonight. And 
The design in front of us that we're about to go on to, out to consultation on has a fundamental flaw in this design that will have a significant impact on not just future residents but e existing residents and that is the removal of all the loading bays in this particular area. The expectation in the report was that, that people will just use the loading bays in Wells Street or the loading bays, I think the other one street that backs onto office works, I'm not sure if it's Little Bank or not, but that's where people will park and they're going to carry their fridge 50, 60 metres and carry their lounge 50, 60 metres and carry all their items 50, 60 metres and that any businesses in this location, you know, I think the officers have mentioned that the businesses in these locations don't need car parks because they will be local businesses such as IGA, 7-Elevens, etc. All of those businesses get deliveries. Now, once again, the expectation is that these delivery trucks will park in the loading bays in Wells or the loading bays at Little Banks and they will somehow carry those pallets 60, 50, 60 metres round to where, wherever their shop is located. That's just not going to happen. Well, and if we want an example of what will happen, go and have a look at Queen's Lane and drive up and down Queen's Lane and see how terrible the public realm is there during the day when it's full of delivery vans, it's full of tradies vans, it's full of moving vans because over many, many years as that area grew there was no insistence on loading base within those blocks, there was no insistence on visitor parking, no insistence on somewhere for, for, for tradies to park. So it all happens on the street and they don't all politely park their cars and wait around the corner or use the loading bay a, a little while away. They just park on the middle of the street outside these buildings. This proposal here is going to result in that exact same behaviour happening here on, on, on Park Street. As much as we might think that a, a loading bay on Well Street will be used by 52 Park Street, it's not. They will park in the middle of the road, they will park on the bike lane, they will park on the footpath and that's a behaviour that is going to occur. So we need to go out to consultation on a proposal that, that caters for that, to, that caters for what is going to occur and then we get input from the residents that live in these locations on what adjustments to this plan they require. Going out to consultation on the current plan with no loading bays, no visitor parking, no anything, means that we will not get appropriate feedback that will shape the plan, we'll just get complete opposition. So what my motion is doing is asking officers to come back to us with a plan that will implement loading bays, that will look at what is required in order to service these built buildings so that these buildings can continue to function so that this roadway can continue to function because not building this bike lane as proposed will cease the function of this particular area. People won't, you know, they're not going to park 60 metres away and carry a fridge. I'm sorry, it's fanciful to think that that's how people are going to behave. So we need to get, what we, before we send something out to consultation, we need to get it right and get it as close to right as we possibly can. It may not be perfect. I, I fully accept that we may have to lose all the car parking in this area. People can walk 60 metres. They might like it, but they can. They can't carry a fridge 60 metres, I'm sorry. And that's one element of this proposal that, that we need to get right. I think we owe it to our community to get this particular element right and try and solve these problems if they're possible to be solved before we send something out to communication and get feedback to consultation and get feedback from the community on, on where they would like some of the, you know, the, the at-grade street public realm elements in this proposal. So that's the, the purpose behind this motion is come back to us, officers, come back to us with a proposal that we can take out to consultation that, that resolves the major flaw in this particular um, proposal before we go out to consultation, not try and resolve it after we've gone out to consultation. Thank you. Councillor Pearl. Thanks for the opportunity, Madam Mayor. Councillor Bond, I think, has put very eloquently and comprehensively the um, arguments councillors around the, the public realm implications of this proposal. 
uh, I, I think it's probably best use of my time if I talk to you about what I think um, the process of consultation through this motion, the Council's recommendation would infer, and also the uh, context of the, the development itself and the timing of the development itself. Uh, but I wholeheartedly agree, particularly with the realm requirements around loading bays and the practicality of businesses and residents in Park Street uh, with the number of planned loading zones and parking bays um, isn't sustainable from a, from a livability point of view. Councillors, you, you would know this area pretty well. We, 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 it's represented by a, a group of solid citizens that, that communicate very constructively with council, and I think most, if not all of us, have all been on a tour of this area. So we, we understand that this is an area of our city that's had the most change compared to any other area in the past 10 years in particular, and that change has happened um, without the context of a planning master plan and without the context of a realm master plan until very recently also. The end result of that has been, in some cases, a hodgepodge of buildings and development, um, and the tram stop, particularly on Park Street, has been a core result of that. Council advocated rightly on behalf of, and we did a good job of this last count, we, sorry, we got a bad result, but I think we did a good job of it as a unified team in terms of the locations of the tram stop and the very predictable effects of the location of that stop would have on tra traffic movements and our recommendations. Unfortunately, those recommendations weren't heeded. Uh, our warnings weren't heeded. And again, another piece of infrastructure goes into an already crowded environment, making the situation worse. That's happened on a big scale in terms of that intervention with Park Street. It's happening again with the loss of parking on Albert Road, and it's happened on smaller scales that have had big effects, particularly with traffic movements around Well Street and, as Councillor Bond inferred, uh, or referred to rather, um, Queens Lane, which is... Uh, uh, we don't need to go there, but it, it, it's, a, um, it's a disaster, pretty much 24-7 now, all because we didn't take time... Um, relevant authorities didn't take the time, make the relevant investment and consult widely and properly to get a quality outcome in the context of the whole area. Councillors, this motion provides you the opportunity to have that time, have that space and get the right outcome. Is this a more costly solution um, in the short run? Happily concede that the penny-pinching councillor that I am, yes, that's exactly what's going to happen. Is the outcome 10 or 20 years from now likely to be better? I, I'm reasonably confident on the balance of probabilities that that indeed will be the case. We need to ensure that our roads are safe, and no one disagrees with that. If we're told an area is, is unsafe, um, as we've had in areas more recently in terms of the closure of Kerford Road, etc., the clo uh, closure of um, a cross-section of Kerford Road, uh, we act, and that's exactly the right thing that we should be doing. But it's fairly obvious from the report and uh, questioning of, of officers, etc., that safety isn't the, the only consideration in terms of the prioritisation of this project. Um, it's the readiness and the shovel readiness of it and also the uh, speed of which we can move to get this project done with co-funding from the state government. And that, that's a good thing, generally speaking, because ratepayers get a, a, a better value outcome. So from an officer's point of view and probably from the state government's point of view, if this motion gets up this evening, councillors, it's probably a, a pretty radical thing. Uh, what I would suggest is it's not a radical thing for the people that are going to be using Park Street and it's not going to be a radical thing for the people that live in and around this area. Uh, they want quality consultation and that means a fully baked idea which goes out to consultation which is ridgy ditch i.e. Uh, real consultation that comes back with ideas that can be actioned on. Uh, the information that we can gather uh, both from briefings on this item and here this evening is if a wide amount of consultation legitimately comes in that the plan that we see here this evening can't be materially altered. So, councillors, in good faith, I don't think we should vote on something to go out to uh, defined consultation until we're all very, very comfortable uh, that we're fully across uh, the consultation and the considerations of safety, um, value for money, resident concerns, all facets and all components of the idea before we actually move forward with a consultation which effectively 
is going to be, um, what I'll say, consultation around the edges. So we're, we're committing to a project that's basically going to go into production and the consultation we get back will result in minor amendments. I, I don't think we're there yet at the moment, um, councillors. I, I think we need more time to work this out. We, we've done this um, to some success in other areas. Uh, what it will require is councillors, uh, sorry, council officers to move quickly and come up with alternate plans. But this area has had too much intervention that hasn't been fully considered in the past and it's causing huge issues for residents and commuters. Um, I think the appropriate place to have the bike corridor, which that area desper desperately needs, uh, is most likely in and around Albert Road. Uh, that's the logical connection with the construction of the Anzac station uh, and the connection with Albert Road and Kerford Road into the Mar existing Murray Street area. Uh, that option needs to be fully investigated also. Uh, and consulted on so we can work out the uh, best solution 10, 20, 30 years from now. We all want safe bike links. links. Um, most of us are going to use these bike links or have children or relatives that use these bike links. We, we want people to be safe, uh, but we need to make sure we get the right outcome. I, I don't think there's a compelling, c compelling reason here this evening to go with the officer's recommendation, which I um, respectfully ask you to fully consider the alternate that Councillor Bond has well considered and put up, uh, albeit it has its own pit pitfalls around increased costs that will be borne by ratepayers. But I think as we take a long-term view, that investment is well worth the outcome. So, councillors, I wholeheartedly um, hope that you'll support Councillor Bond's motion here this evening and uh, very happy to second it. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So anyone else like to speak to the motion? Councillor Consolo. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you to the speakers tonight and the emails received. I would like to first acknowledge the bicycle riders, of which I am one. We hope the Shrine to Sea project along Albert Road and Kerford Road delivers improved cycling infrastructure to the area. I'm not against additional bike routes in the area. Park Street is indeed scary to cycle in its existing arrangement, but this needs to be done with consideration of the constraints of the nominated street the livability of, for the existing residents and the impact of the future known changes of nearby streets. If Park Street was a newly developed area, this type of streetscape could be suitable as there would be adequate provisions for loading, access, parking in the buildings or behind. But it is an existing area with known increasing density. The Super Tram station placed in Park Street fundamentally changed this street. We need to look at how we need to look again at how bicycles can travel through this area harmoniously with the residents and businesses existing in the area. I do worry that the bike lanes will be, in, will be compromised by people parking quickly to deliver a package or move a heavy item of furniture without proper provision of loading zones in the area. It is wonderful to see 30 car parks are feasible in Bank Street. I do hope this proceeds as soon as possible. We need to look for other areas we can get these wins, no matter how small, because they add up. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Councillor Martin. I'm going to speak against Councillor Bond's um, alternate motion. I'm speaking with, with, with some reluctance because I've listened very carefully to the arguments of our people in the chamber and I think many of the arguments they've raised are extraordinarily valid ones. I've listened to many of Councillor Bond's arguments and I'm inclined to accept most of them as well. I really think this is a, this is a concept that needs a lot more thinking, but I'm to find out exactly what our community want and to be clear in my own mind about what we should do, I would like to hear from all of our community. We've heard from some people tonight. I'd like the consultation process to go ahead. I'd like to come back and consider what the consultation brings back to the Council. There's no way that I would be committing the council to speak to any expenditure on this on the current project unless we'd gone through a consultation process but I believe if we wait a few months we take an officer's recommendation back to council we go through a consultation process then then we have further exchanges when we come back from that consultation process we may never get anything done or sorry we may never get to a resolution of whether we're going to do anything or not if we have a consultation process now at least through the consultation process we'll have a lot more information so we can make some informed decisions now, while I agreed with, I think, 90% of the speakers in the chamber, I very, very strongly sympathise with what they've said, 
One issue I will take, one comment I will take issue is it's that people don't see cyclists in Park Street. Well, I've been in Park Street. I only wear brown trousers when I go down Park Street because I am really scared going down that street, and that's because it is bloody dangerous, particularly when you get to that um, that super tram stop. So. I, I believe there would be many, many people who'd want, many, many cyclists who'd want to use Park Street if it was safe. But I only want the cyclists to be using Park Street if we could do it in a safe way that also took, in, took addressed the needs of the local residents. But I think a community consultation is probably the best way to find out what everyone wants. Then we can come back to council with perhaps an amended proposal. Councillor Baxter. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I won't be supporting this um, alternative uh, motion and um, I'll foreshadow that if this were to fail, I'll move the original officer's recommendation. Um, I think that there's been a lot of conflation between the merits of the project and the actual recommendation uh, that we're looking at, which is about going out to consultation on the project. Um, and I think that that's uh, deliberate. Um, in some cases because there are some people who simply don't want to see this project go ahead and they think that the best way to do that is to prevent it ever going out to consultation in the first place. Um, but I think it's actually really important that we go out to consultation. Um, we've uh, council uh, officers um, and in consultation with the community and, with cons and in consultation with councillors have put a lot of work into developing um, the draft concept design, um, taking into account all sorts of really important factors. Um, what they, they, these are experts who um, really have to take into account the kinds of things that some councillors have said they haven't taken into account. But they, they have to and they do that and that's their job. Um, so they've done that and they've done that, um, you know, uh, working with uh, the community. Some elements of the community have voiced that they're unhappy with the, with the draft concept plan and that's okay. We'll put that out for consultation and we'll get that feedback. And we'll also get the feedback of the people that we haven't heard from yet um, so that we can then make sure that what we're delivering is um, the best thing uh, that we can deliver. Um, but I think that uh, deferring the, um, the consultation puts us at a lot of risk, in, uh, particularly in terms of timelines. Um, I note that um, Councillor Pearl said that you know when we're notified of, of, of uh, unsafe issues, we we act on them. I note that on Kerford Road, this council actually made a decision to hold off on on. Um, uh, on making uh, certain changes to, to Kerford Road to make it safer and we actually lost black spot funding because of that deferral. Um, I'm quite worried that if we were to stuff around with these timelines we could lose state um, funding uh, for this project and so, <coughs> pardon me, I've got something stuck in my throat. Um, so I, I really uh, would urge councillors to uh, support the original officer's recommendation to go ahead with um, with the consultation. Pardon me. <coughs> You're going to be okay. Go and get yourself a glass. Oh, you've got water. Uh, would any other councillors like to speak to the motion? Uh, uh, Councillor Cupsey? Thank you. Yes, I won't be supporting the alternative motion. Um, I, uh, will, I'm glad that Councillor Baxter has foreshadowed that he would move the officer's recommendation should this fail. Um, I think, unfortunately, a little bit of what is happening is trying to put the cart before the horse slightly. The purpose of the consultation is to elicit these discussions in the community. And so the best way to do that is not to preempt what we think we're going to hear. We know that there are some strong views within um, the community. Um, and there may also be other things that we haven't found out about this project yet by putting, before putting out a design for community feedback. I know that some people will be waiting for council put, to put the, uh, the project out to community feedback in order to take advantage of that um, situation. And so the appropriate thing for us to do in terms of pro process is now to um, share where we're up to with this project and solicit all of the feedback from um, those who are living nearby, those who are using the strip already and the people who um, may not be aware really of where the project is up to and will be notified through the consultation and have their ability to participate. I acknowledge there are some very strongly held views within um, some of the community. I'm also interested that councillors have received some 
um, correspondence that indicates that there might not be a unanimous view amongst residents and the consultation process is the best way for us to tease out um, those various views and then find it find ways that we can attempt to get the best fit solution that is going to serve everybody on this street. I also think that um, there's a huge focus on one element of this project, but the reality is that what we are trying to design here is a street that will work better for everyone. People have spoken already this evening about the increased congestion that the area is facing. Um, the real problem is that if we don't actually tackle this issue, that is just going to get worse and worse, particularly post-COVID. Um, so here is the design that has been worked on um, for some, some time and has taken uh, initial consultation and feedback into account, but the whole purpose of this pro point in the process is to put it out there, receive the feedback, and then consider what modifications um, will work best to respond to that feedback, but also deliver a really good vision for this area. Um, it's not in the best shape right now, and I share the grave concerns around this deferral, we've seen it, we have seen it happen before that we've lost funding because we have paused in project timelines and I think that that would be a real disaster, a real reputational issue for council. And I just don't think it's a necessary risk to take because the point of the consultation process is actually to elicit this discussion. So I will not be supporting this alt motion and I hope that we'll have a chance to vote on the officer's recommendation and would urge other councillors um, who are deciding tonight what to do, um, that we can actually have, still have these discussions. I don't think it's correct to, um, to paint it that we can't um, make modifications to the design. That's the entire purpose of the consultation process. So uh, don't feel that that avenue is being cut off. Um, that's precisely what we are hoping to do through the officer's recommendation tonight. And I hope that I'll have a chance to support that. I also want to thank everybody who's taken time to engage with this process because um, we appreciate it and we need to come to a solution that's actually going to work for the street. So thank you for everyone who's had input so far. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? I will. Uh, I won't be supporting uh, this alternative motion for a number of reasons and it's been alluded to by other councillors. This is a process of consultation. Uh, we have been consulting and talking about this particular bi uh, bike path for most of the last term and here we are doing that. And, and I note that there have been many, um, uh, there has been because of uh, urging the community looking at other streets that have still come back to being this street as the one that would be the most suitable. I note that we have listened to um, much of our community and there have been changes. I do note that in this design, they discovered 30, uh, a way to have 30 car spaces around the corner. That's a great innovation. I also note that there are loading bays on the side streets and I'm not saying that anything is a perfect solution, but we have heard that there is a need for loading bays and so there have been included in the design, not on Park Street, but around the corner. Now. I've worked on streets where people get deliveries all the time and they use trolleys and removalists use trolleys and for oh and reasons that's becoming more and more common. And again, none of this is ideal, but there are ways of parking around the corner and using trolleys to safely move furniture and any other deliveries. And uh, this is, this is, it's doable, not convenient necessarily, but doable. I think that this is a realm where so much is changing. It's a public realm that so much is changing and a lot of it is beyond council's remit. And I don't think that's going to stop. So I think there is a, a challenge of dealing with what is to what you wish it to be. Unfortunately, it's not going back to what it was. Uh, and now we have the challenge of facing um, increased pedestrian and bikes as the Anzac station comes online. Uh, and we also have to um, deal with safety issues. I, I do think that is part of the conversation that steep, keeps, and it's difficult because humans, we hate change, but the behavior change is actually a huge part of the change in this area. 
congestion will only grow. We need to drive alternatives. People, it's not an area where you can have multiple cars. It is not as good. It's not an area that is changing to make it easy to own and move around in a car. And part of that, so that there isn't, for the people that do need to use cars, we need to provide an alternative, a safe alternative. I note too that officers over time have listened to the community and they are going to get signalised lights put in on that street. That's a big win. So there have been, we have listened, officers have delivered, and again, it's not perfect. That street itself, when we walked through it, is not a particularly nice street, and the upgrade of this street design would make it a beautiful opportunity <laughs> for businesses to actually survive. And the number of people living around there are more likely to walk to it than drive. The loading bays, yes, an issue. But there are, in this design, loading bays nearby and trolleys and alternative uses will have to be found. The other element that I want to explore in this consultation project is the private realm. Owners' corporations need to step up. I feel like everything's being left to council where solutions need to be found with owners alongside owners' corps around how deliveries and things will work. And that's something that hasn't... I really would like to find more um, out in that space because... Um, Again, design, particularly new designs, we've been saying it for a long time, but it is public realm, and public realm can change. Uh, so where we can find solutions on property, I mean, who's to know that in future years, if, the, um, if we weren't to put it in, that the traffic might get so great that they make it an internal clearway, the same problem will occur. Public realm changes. So I do think we need to find uh, solutions on site as well as... Um, ensuring that there are loading bays nearby, but we also have to consider safety. So I will, I am interested hearing for further parts of the community that we don't often hear from, and this extensive consultation will hopefully capture some of those. So I will be um, not supporting this motion by Councillor Bond. Are there any other councillors that would like to speak to it? Councillor Bond, would you like to close? Um, just quickly, you're right, Madam Mayor, to point out the benefits of the additional 30 parking spots in uh, Bank Street. That's a win for the community, and it, it's been included here because that can happen regardless of what we do on Park Street, and should happen regardless of what we do on Park Street. Um, that you know, any any way we're able to provide additional parking in this area is, is a good outcome. Um, there will still be a consultation. It'll just be a consultation on a better design than the one we're currently or proposing to to put out the consultation tonight. And then we can get feedback on elements of a proposal that can be refined and elements that can be massaged and elements that can be changed as a result of community feedback. Instead of spending all our time discussing a fatal flaw that will, will negatively change the functionality of this particular road, I would rather hear from residents you know, great quality information about what they would like to see change in this area instead of having it just a constant conversation about you know, what I think will happen is this fatal flaw, the fact that you know, the, what we're going to expect people to carry fridges 60, 70 metres, that's just not going to happen. So let's, in, in 10 or 20 years' time, we will have a much better outcome here if we delay this a little bit and spend a little bit more money. And that's what we're here to do is about the long-term outcome here, not a short-term outcome. So I urge my fellow councillors to support this motion. I am going to put the motion. All those in favour? All those against? The motion is carried. Moving on to item 13.1, which is the proposed extension of business parklets. Councillors, do we have any questions of the officers in relation to this report? Councillor Pearl. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Sorry, I thought I had a bit of paper in front of me. I didn't. Um, my, I'll just ask the question. I'm not exactly sure I'm re referencing it to. Um, in the, uh, I think it was, yeah, here it is here. Uh, 3.2, uh, when you refer to commence work on a longer-term policy, what, what, just give us some timelines around that longer-term policy because um, this is a great program that seems to be working quite well. So just interested to see what, what, what sort of timeline to get the permanent solution in place so that can inform our decision around a temporary extension. Through you, Mayor, uh, there, there is a bit of work that needs to be done 
uh, with respect to a longer term policy. Obviously, we would work with the um, business parklet guidelines that we've got as a base. Um, but in essence, what would be addressed or sought to be addressed through a longer term policy would be items like uh, the use of public space for commercial purposes and the fees that would be charged, balancing the use of public space for hospitality businesses versus other businesses on the main streets, including balancing parking and other transport requirements, including loading zones. Uh, temporary versus permanent installations, who would pay for the structure, any traffic changes that may be required and maintenance, the compliance criteria, accessibility and uh, considerations around community use and contribution when not being used. So there are, f there are a few things that need to be addressed there. Obviously, officers would work or look to work quite quickly in, in doing that, but as um, councillors have heard from the speakers tonight, there are some differences of view in the community on that. So there is some policy work to do, plus uh, some engagement um, to be undertaken. Uh, with respect to the exact time frames, I don't have that um, before me today, but certainly I would think that um, yeah, we'd be looking to do that quickly, um, but we may not hit the June um, time frame for an adoption of policy, as well as an implementation of policy to give uh, confidence to business. Councillor Pearl. Fully accept on June, December. Through you, Mayor. So, yeah, I think December is certainly a, a workable time frame given the key issues and the need to do good community engagement. Um, hence the officer's recommendation. Councillor Pearl. The summer months are very different from the winter months, duh. Um, do, do, does, and the use of these parklets will be will be a different function as well also. So I'm just wondering, um, is there any uh, health and safety risk that we need to be uh, cognizant of? Um, we want to keep these spaces tidy, etc. that some of them are temporary, so they might be run down. Is there any way council can monitor and keep an eye on perhaps those sites that don't um, weather all that well during the winter months? Um, what, what, what have we got in terms of safeguards around that sort of thing? Uh, through you, Mayor, part of the current program is a, a compliance activity, so uh, officers from our local laws area certainly um, ensure that they're maintaining compliance um, on those parklets and also respond to customer uh, feedback and complaints on, on items or parklets that may be considered to be unsafe. Uh, through you, Mayor, uh, we'd also need to look at safety in winter months, uh, you know, things like gas heaters and things like that, where, which are used in the public realm. Obviously, we're going to have to uh, work out um, some of those issues. Um, and then, uh, but the good thing about the permanent policy, uh, Council Pill, is uh, there are a number of other inner metropolitan councils that we're talking to who are working on that, and there are some good overseas. Um, examples of permanent parklet policies. We just have to fit them to Australian regulations and standards. Uh, Councillor Baxter, sorry, and then Councillor Bond after that. Um, yeah, uh, look, I, I just wanted to know, in terms of the um, the data that's going to go into the formation of the, the policy, are we also making sure that we're capturing um, all sorts of... Um, not not just the um, the benefits to the public realm and to the businesses, but also um, what what we're doing here is we're repurposing uh, on street parking to a different purpose. You know, high, high, highest and best use, you, you, you might say. Um, and you know, uh, are we looking at gathering data on what effect there uh, has been there? Um, uh, because I mean, there there are clearly some areas where there's been no really net negative effect. The business owners are telling us that their business is up, even though they, they've lost three car parks right outside their business, their business is up. And that sounds fantastic. Um, we've heard from other areas where that may be, um, may or may not be having a negative impact. I won't, I won't preempt anything, but you know, we've, we've certainly heard some mixed feedback from other areas. So I just want to know a little bit more about the data that we're gathering around those impacts on a, on a, on a use of land sort of, um, angle. Through, 
through you, Mayor, to inform uh, the development of this report, officers surveyed uh, parklet or business parklet applicants, uh, and, and some of that information is included in the report in terms of broader impact to the public realm and community. That's certainly something that could be considered as part of the broader um, policy development. A follow-up question? Um, yeah, how, how do councillors um, influence the, uh, the policy development going from here, I suppose? Um, because, the, yeah, that's something I would like to see, I guess. Uh, through you, Mayor, uh, if Council um, were to pass this motion uh, tonight, uh, we would work with you through a series of briefings. One of the first um, briefings that we would look to do would be to workshop with you the policy outcomes uh, that you're seeking, and that may well be one of the policy outcomes that you wish to see front and centre in the policy. So we would do that um, quite quickly after today's um, uh, meeting if, if councillors were in agreement. I'll go to Councillor Bond, or is it follow-up on that? It's a follow-up. Oh, sorry, Councillor Baxter. Last one, and then I'll shut up. Um, uh, in terms of the development of this, of this policy, um, the scope of it I'm still a little bit unsure of, um, would it also include um, how we might consider transitioning some of these to permanent fixtures that would not become car spaces uh, again? Through you, Mayor, so the intent or scope of the policy, obviously we would workshop with Council um, and, and you may well wish to, um, to have the scope looking at uh, both uh, permanent installations and temporary installations. Councillor Bond. Um, my question was around the, the, the CEO delegations. Um, one of the reasons we were able to respond so quickly to the applications from our business community for parklets was the fact that we delegated the, the authorisation for this to the CEO, which means in some instances we could turn it around, we could respond and issue permits within, I think it was 48, 72 hours in some instances. I'm looking at Lauren, I've got a head nod. I'm not making that up, which we got some terrific feedback on. If we were to remove this delegation, what would the turnaround time from application to approval be if, if, if these applications all had to come to a council meeting? Um, and apologies for having my back to you. Uh, through you, Mayor. Good question, Councillor Bond. Uh, it would certainly be much, there'd be a much longer duration than you know, 24 or 48 hours. Obviously, the, the cycle of council is a two-weekly cycle. So, um, at, yeah, at a minimum, it could be as, as small as two weeks, depending upon when the application came in, unless council were of a mind to call a special meeting or series of special meetings to deal with these items in a timely manner. Councillor Clark. Motion, sorry. Oh, I'm just going to, yeah, are there any more questions of the officers? I have two quick ones, okay. if I may. Uh, I was wondering, does this include, this is an extension for the business parklets, not the ones that council installed. They will be removed at the end of April. Uh, through you, Mayor, yes, that's correct. So this is business parklets that businesses have paid for, but the community parklets, as I understand it, would be removed. And, and my other question was, um, so the delegation to extend them uh, has, has to uh, criteria around limited or if any substantiated compliance issues and limited if any substantiated negative trade, trader or community feedback. And obviously we know that really in most places it's been fine except for one street. Uh, the challenge is, uh, and I, I note that some uh, of those parklets are only used in day or night, is I, I wonder if there is a balance of finding a way to perhaps retain for some of the, the businesses where one is night and one is day, um, or, do, or is there the possibility, I know this is complicating, um, of keeping a parklet that, where people can take takeaways to? I guess I just, it, it seems, um, is there a balance or is that what officers will consider as part of that process? 
uh, through you, May, if I understand the question, um, in terms of um, the compliance issues, um, 3.8 of the officers recommend that, or the 3.7 um, delegates to myself as a CEO, which I'll under delegate the authority to limit the period of the parklet if there are compliance issues. And, and my discussions with the team is that we'd have a sort of three strikes and you're out type approach, or, th or and after two strikes you'd probably go to a fortnightly rolling permit until you until you could go back to a longer permit. So it's an incentive for the parklet owner um, to, to comply with the permit. Um, and obviously, um, we uh, we wouldn't issue that strike unless we were sure there was a breach of the permit. Uh, uh, a complaint may not necessarily generate, if you like, a, a warning that the, the permit had been breached. I think the second part of your question is um, um, on the community park, let's we'll obviously look to see how we can reuse some of that infrastructure. Maybe that's something we can do to, to help. Um, with um, the sort of a place for people to go for takeaways and those sorts of things. And our current parklet guidelines, uh, we already work with traders who, and you saw an example from the speakers tonight, where we share daytime use and nighttime use so that we don't take up more parking spots than necessary. And obviously, as Ms. Bennis, uh, as Kylie Bennis mentioned, in the new policy, um, where uh, will look at one of the outcomes being community use of those parklets when they're not being used by the business or the, you know, the business is open for limited hours and, and the community can use those. So they're all um, policy um, aspects that will be addressed in the new policy. Councillor Clark. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, as I said, I'd like to um, bring an alternative motion for consideration. Yep, if you could um, read out, is it on the screen? Not yet. Oh, well, once, once it gets up on the screen, if you could um, read out the alternate motion, please. Would you like me just to read the changes or the whole motion? Uh, yeah, just the changes, please. Okay, so uh, 3.4 uh, now reads, extend the business parklet program until June 30th, 2021, and removes and the delegate and delegates to the CEO in 3.7 below the ability to further extend this until December 2021, dependent upon the time frame for the finalisation of the longer term policy position. Uh, the other changes, it adds a 3.5 or a new 3.5, notes that a further report on the progress of the longer term policy will be brought to council in May 2021. And as part of this process, a further extension of the parklet program may be sought to enable the finalisation of the policy. And the other change is that it removes 3.9, which states delegates, delegates to the delegate, sorry, <laughs> to the CEO, the authority to extend the program from June 2021 to December 2021, if this is required, to allow time for a longer-term policy to be approved by council. Thank you. Do I have a seconder, Councillor Sirikov? Councillor Clark, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, it was great to hear tonight some very positive feedback about the parklets and um, there's no doubt they've been a great initiative uh, for residents and for traders. Um, we have also heard some negative feedback um, about the parklets and it's, it's fair to say that while they've been uh, good for the community and COVID and traders, uh, there is also um, a need to assess the impact and it can be on a very much a case-by-case basis basis depending on where the parklet is located. Um, there are impacts such as um, residents car parking and I know the um, canal ward councillors are due to meet with some residents about the impact to them uh, and there's also impact for some traders on the, in, uh, the installation of the car parklets. So it is different for each. Um, the changes that I'm proposing in this motion um, uh, for provide for council, um, sorry, let me say that again. The changes in this motion provide council officers with the opportunity to bring this back to councillors, a detailed pro program or proposal before it ends. The change in the motion is, is doesn't change the the decision on the parklets. It doesn't change whether they're a good initiative or not, um, they may well be extended. However, what this does is um, 
removes the decision to extend it automatically to December from council officers and brings it back to councillors so that councillors will make the decision um, around whether it gets extended. So, as I said, it's, there's a whole lot of uh, considerations and the communication and, and um, uh, community consultation is important. Um, and I believe that decision uh, needs to be made through councillors. So I'm not unsupportive of parklets, not at all. Um, and, but the changes, as I said, doesn't change anything to do with whether parklets get extended. It is purely to make sure it doesn't get automatically extended and we have the full opportunity to consider the impacts and with a, you know, a report by the officers to, to take into consideration all, all of the aspects. Uh, it still provides council officers with the ability to provide a parklet, to um, make some changes if they need to because of complaints. Uh, it doesn't change any of that, uh, the current ability that they have to manage the parklet program. It merely, the changes merely talk to the automatic extension and the delegation to council officers. So for that reason, um, that is why I'm moving the motion, um, the parklets are um, the, the parklets and whether we keep them or not or the fact that they've been a great initiative is, is not um, part of the consideration for the changes that I'm proposing. Thank you. Councillor Sirikoff. Uh, I want to support Councillor Clark's um, amendment um, because I don't see that we'll be changing anything that's currently happening or what's already been pro proposed except that we, the councillors have the opportunity um, uh, at, at a later date, instead of at December, um, to reflect what's been happening over the next three, four months. And so that deci decision comes back to us. Would any other councillor, Councillor Pearl? Thanks, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Clark, for putting the amendment up this evening. I'd like to speak against the amendment and foreshadow that if this motion fails, that I'd be happy to move the officer's recommendation. It's a small amendment, um, but I think it has a fairly substantial effect. And the, the ultimate argument that we're talking about in this instance, councillors, is speed versus control. So, albeit... Uh, as councillors, well, as a, as a councillor, I'm, I'm, I always like to have more control over things. I'd, I'd rather make mo more decisions than less decisions, and um, w w the right of delegation has to be appropriately put. Uh, I think the right of delegation under the officer's recommendation is appropriate, um, particularly around the timing of the decision of June to December. I think the CEO is the appropriate person to make that and uh, these small decisions to get things approved um, need to move quickly to keep our local economy uh, moving along. The case-by-case -case basis assessment will still be done. It will be done by officers uh, and councillors, are, you know, you're all welcome to inform that process through the CEO and those decisions will still be made, but I think they'll be made at a much greater speed uh, which helps our local economy um, and empowers offers, officers to do something which they've already been doing for a considerable amount of time and they've proven through the evidence provided here this evening that they're um, adequate to do it and really the issues we've had, I think, um, I've had three or four inquiries come through of a negative nature that, that there are some out there, uh, but I think wholeheartedly the CEO and his team has, um, has done a good job of this and uh, I have full confidence that the officer's recommendation will, will hold. So I, I would um, ask you to uh, vote down this motion. I'm more than happy to foreshadow that I'll put the officer's recommendation in the event this motion fails. Councillor Copsey, did you have a hand out? Uh, Councillor Baxter. Um, yeah, so I, I won't be supporting this alternate motion. I'll be happy to support the um, officer's uh, recommendation if... Um, if Councillor Pearl uh, moves it. Um, I agree. I think that um, one, uh, I, one of the best things about this program that, is, that has gone out is that we were able to move quickly. And after being on council for four years, I really feel like some things never move as quickly as I would like them to. But this one certainly did. And we're just, 
we've we've had so much praise from so many quarters, notwithstanding some issues in some areas, um, that with uh, with our implementation of it. So I'd like to I'd like to continue uh, with that, and I'm very comfortable in the knowledge that at any time. A councillor can say to the CEO, <clears throat> we'd like to call it this decision in. We'd like to bring it back into council chambers because something has changed. But until such uh, time as that, I think um, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, I've been very happy with the, um, with the process um, so far. Would any other councillor, Councillor Bond? Um, just before I speak to this, I'll quickly just read out a text message I've received from a Fitzroy Street business owner. Um, who wasn't able to make it here tonight with his thoughts. Um, the, you know, there's a large investment laid out that needs to be recouped by our businesses with the, the builds they put out on the streets, increased capacity without affecting social distancing. It's kept business alive and viable, brings good vibe atmosphere to the streets and precincts, ensures against any possible future waves restrictions over the, the winter and perception of safe to, safer dining in the open is adhered to and chance to make the area of Port Phillip a feature standout precinct. So, you know, yes, there have been issues with some areas of our, our parklets, but overwhelmingly the feedback has been, has been very, very positive. Um, I know there's been numerous media, media reports about that specifically have referenced Port Phillip and the help we've given our local businesses, which has been fantastic for us as a council to, to hear that feedback from our traders and, and from our residents. And overwhelmingly, people, people love them. I think one of the strongest elements about how the way we responded was the quick turnarounds. We were able to give people permits within 48, 72 hours, which you know, these businesses were bringing me back saying, I can't believe how quickly I got a permit. So that was... That was very well received, and I think we got that right um, you know, most of the time, if not all of the time. So I, I think it's something that we can continue with those those delegations, and we always have the ability, should we feel that um, they're not being properly applied, we can we can call them in at any time as as councillors. So you know, I, I won't be supporting this alternate uh, motion, but I do understand why why it was brought forward, um, and, and we'll support the original officers recommendation when it when it comes back via Councillor Pearl. Uh, Councillor Consolo. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the quick development of these parklets delivered an impressive result. Uh, the goal is to get the policy right, but ideally push the time frame so traders get that certainty or more certainty to know if they want to invest more. We've already seen the weather change this week a little bit where it's not as nice being outside when it's cold and it's going to change the parklets a lot. On the flip side, we've heard the, uh, that it's been hard on other businesses and we need to reflect this and consider our long-term policy. So I, I think it'd be a good checkpoint to look at this in May and June, but with obviously the ability to extend. Uh, would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Councillor Martin. I'm going to speak against the amended motion, or sorry, the uh, the alternate motion. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Simply because we need to give our traders some certainty. And while we can always delegate to the CEO the, the power to make changes, or we can call in particular parklets that we're not comfortable with, in general, if we support the original motion and don't carry this motion, we're letting our traders know that we're out there supporting them, and I commend the original motion to you and urge you to, support, to vote against the amended motion. Or sorry, the, hit me with the right word again, the alternate motion. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Councillor Clark, would you like to close? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so I just want to clarify this, this alternative motion is not to um, not be supportive of traders in having parklets. It's need, it's it does not change any of the processes in terms of parklets. Um, it is not to slow down the provision of them or the removal of them as the officers see fit. Uh, it, nor does it remove the, the existing ones that are there and nor does it signal that the program may not extend. So I'm going to say that again because uh, nothing in the changes that are proposed uh, changes the officers' ability to um, provide new ones, remove them, extend them. Um, it, all this is saying is that 
the, at the end of June, this comes back to councillors uh, for consideration of all the aspects of the program. It does not mean that it won't continue. Um, so just to clarify that, um, and that is the basis for the amendment. Thank you. Councillors, I will now put the motion. All those in favour? Uh, all those against? The motion has failed. Uh, moving on to... What does... ah. Yes, all right, that's right. <laughs> we have to pass the other one, if we so wish. Councillor Pearl, I believe you foreshadowed something. Very happy to move the officer's recommendation and um, I'll, um, I'll reserve my right to speak at the end. Do you have a seconder? Councillor... Councillor Bond, would you like to speak to it? Uh, would anyone else like to speak to it? Councillor Copsey. Um, just to thank everybody who came and spoke on this item tonight. It's been, it's been um, a really wonderful thing to see. Um, seldom do we do something in council that has such an immediate impact and I'm really heartened to hear at the way that it's um, been appreciated and supportive by the businesses who've taken up these opportunities but also uh, the community. God knows in the last year we've needed spaces to connect um, safely and this has been a really um, great little silver lining. So I'm really looking forward to seeing a longer term uh, policy to guide this into the future. And I just wanted to note the incredibly hard work behind the scenes of the CEO and the officers in processing these. It was no small feat when we were, you know, nearly a year ago confronted with the news of coronavirus. Um, I can't speak highly enough of the dedication and hard work that has gone in over the last year in this organisation responding to issues such as this. So I just wanted to call that out and acknowledge that the CEO's experience in placemaking and um, the quick response and engagement with this, this issue has really, I think, borne great fruit. I look forward to seeing the policy come back and um, I'm glad that we can provide a bit of certainty, although of course we can always bring anything in if there's issues along the way. Any other councillor like to speak to the motion? I'll speak briefly. It is nice to hear some positive <laughs> response from the community <laughs> occasionally when one is on council. Uh, and, you know, being a hospitality professional myself, uh, I know how tough it would be um, to have been through this last year uh, and shutting doors. I do acknowledge that obviously in the development of the policy there is a balance and there are there are tweaks and criteria and things that need to get adjusted and so um, to try and get the balance right and so I'm happy to support this motion. Um, I do note that, that perhaps on some areas maybe there's a balance so that it's not all gone and, and there's a balance to find dual purpose ones in the meantime and the extension uh, rather than ultimate stopping. Uh, but I acknowledge there, there are challenges in some areas more than others in response to this. But again, I want to echo Councillor Copsey's. Uh, Peter uh, and Lauren and Kylie and the team uh, did incredible work with incredible um, patience and, and agility and timeliness. It was incredible. Um, so uh, thank you again for all of that exceptional work. Um, I look forward to how we can make this policy better. Um, for all of uh, the traders and residents and get it right because it has added a vibrancy uh, to the community that we didn't have before and and what was the most heartening to hear from the various speakers tonight to this issue was the sense of community that they have created. Uh, who knew a few car parks turned into an outdoor space hmm, that people have said for years that's what you should do actually works. So uh, I really... Um, I think that's the stuff that you can't measure too that I keep banging on about. That sense of community, that sense of belonging somewhere to meet up and, and, and spend time with other people in your community uh, is invaluable and that's what we heard tonight. Anyone else would like to speak or I'll go back to Councillor Pearl to close. Councillor Pearl. Thanks Madam Mayor. Councillors can uh, obviously commend this motion to you here this evening. Just three or four quick points, if I, if I may. It's been a bit, bit of a difficult night, firstly, for, for some of the officers here in terms of some previous motions that we considered here, but, but this organisation and this group of councillors should be very proud of what this did 
this initiative did for our community, uh, our business leaders, our traders, and also people that are employed in those businesses. As you heard here tonight, um, we, we were the vessel that allowed uh, people to go from a very difficult situation into actually growing their business year on year. Some of these businesses did more trade in 20 than they did in 19, which back in March 20 would have been unforeseeable for, for most of us sitting here. And for them, and, and you as officers did that, and you should be extraordinarily proud of it. Um, and that money went into people's families, it went into people's school clothes, it, it, it fed people. It's a, it, it's a very big deal, and I, I don't think I can um, convey uh, my thanks more greatly to you. The economic emergency that the council declared at the time uh, had very rightful criticism around, well, you've declared an emergency with nothing attached to it, what are you, what, what are you actually doing here? And, and, and this... Um, culture in the organisation for a short period of time, which I hope permeates over a longer period of time, uh, is exactly the evidence of what that emergency was all about. It was to make sure that officers um, understood the direction from councillors that we wanted the organisation to take this situation really seriously and focus on jobs, employment, at protecting uh, businesses and helping business transi transition and thrive. And uh, you, you, you've done that. And you should be very, very proud of it. And I thank the CEO for his leadership in response to this. And as the Mayor said, you, you heard a, an overwhelming positive response tonight from a group of people that you would never normally see at a council meeting. Um, and it was wonderful for them to come here uh, this evening. The other thing, particularly the Councillor Bax's previous point to the other motion, is that the local economy has changed and our local economy is very fortunate in some respects um, compared to the inner city economy whereby uh, you know, the domestic local economy, particularly for eateries and high streets, is actually probably bigger now in some cases than it was before the crisis. Um, and, and that's something our traders are able to take advantage of. Perhaps it's at the cost of the City of Melbourne and the CBD, uh, and we're very sorry for that, but Council has enabled those traders to be able to transition into a, in, into a much newer environment, and, and that's created jobs locally, which, which, which overall is, is fantastic for the economy. So uh, thanks very much to the officers. Very happy to get this through to December, and very happy to hopefully get it in uh, permanently, um, and, and, and councillors this was a rare occasion where council was able to move very quickly. Um, this never would have happened if COVID had come along. It would have been stuck down in a task force or a committee or a policy uh, statement and we wouldn't have been able to do it at this scale um, to this effect and we should be enormously proud of it. Now, I haven't gone through the details of the $250,000 given to us by the state government in terms of where we invested that money and I don't really want to see where it went because I'm sure some of it was wasted on stuff that we didn't get good value of. Um, and I don't really care, to be frank. Um, there's other things this council did at that time that we did quickly and at speed that didn't work as well, uh, and I'm happy to take those as well because what, what the officers did do is they took direction from councillors to move in certain areas, and this was one of them, at speed to get things done. Some of them worked, some of them didn't work as well. Um, it's easy to see something that worked well publicly here this evening. We'll start to see perhaps some things come to council that didn't work as well. Um, and we'll have to you know, defend those as vigorously as we defend this success in some respects. So well done to the councillors uh, and well done to council officers. Hope you all support this motion here this evening. Councillors, I'll now put that motion. All those in favour? That has passed. Was that unanimously? It doesn't really matter. It was it unanimously. Uh, moving on to item now, appropriately, 14... Oh, do we want to take a five-minute break, everyone? Yes, all right. Everyone, let's take a five-minute break. We will adjourn for a moment. Uh, councillors, let's come back and focus. We're moving to item 14.1, which is the councillors' expenses and support policy, the adoption of... Uh, do we have any questions of the officers in regards to this report? Uh, no questions? Councillors... Oh, Councillor Martin. How much time and effort goes into councillors, sorry, with, with council officers preparing the financial statements? So when, when we're looking at councillors' expenses, what am, expense report, what amount of time goes into preparing those reports? Kylie Bennett. Uh, through you, Mayor, I might ask uh, Rachel Russell to answer that question. Thank you. Through you, Mayor, um, it takes approximately one day because we uh, gather all the information and we reconcile it also with our finance department as well.
could I ask a further question? Is that that's for the quarterly expenses it takes to do one day? Correct. It will take the same amount of time to, to produce a monthly report. Um, sorry. Uh, if we produce it monthly, yeah, it would still take the same amount of time, but there would be less data sort of that we're reconciling. So it would be yeah, the same amount of time approximately whether we're producing it quarterly or monthly. A three-year mail might assist. So the, the current quarterly report, given the volume of data that's collected on a quarterly basis, I'm advised takes uh, about a day of officers' time to reconcile. Um, reporting on a more frequent um, basis, obviously there's less, um, less data that you're sort of trying to capture um, through, you know, a, an increased frequency in reporting. So if you were reporting on monthly, you're looking at a, a lesser amount of data. So I'd just make that comment. But it would still take officer time to do all of that. I mean, it's not, is it halved? Is it quartered? We don't really know until we do it. Uh, through, through you, Mayor, it is a requirement under the Local Government Act for uh, council and officers to report on um, councillor allowances and expenses. Um, the officers have established processes uh, to capture um, that, that information. Um, in terms of the difficulty of it, I, I'm not sure. I don't um, perform that task myself. Um, however, obviously we're looking for ways to streamline also the reporting in that space as well. Are there any other questions? Uh, councillors, we have uh, our officer's recommendation or something different. Councillor Pearl? Thanks, Madam Mayor. just want to move an uh, alternate motion, if I could, if the officer could be kind enough to bring that up for me. You could read out the adjustments. If you could type it up for me, that would be great, and I'll read it out. Sorry, I just gave the handwritten notice to the officers, that's all. My thanks to the officers for doing that. The changes uh, to the officers' recommendation with the following changes, 3.2, um, attachment 1 with the following change, and the addition of 3.2.1, that officers prepare a monthly council report on council allowances and expenses. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Baxter? We've got a question, Councillor Sirikov. That's all right, I'll allow a question if it's a clarifying question. Uh, three, Mayor, can I just uh, ask Councillor Pearl if that's a council report rather than a report on the website? Would he mind if that's his intent, probably put the word council report in there, or is it a report on the website that you seek? It, it's on the, I did seek advice on that before. I said on the website. So it would be coming to council quarterly and on the website can monthly. I, is that just, correct? I'll just get this correct for you, Councillor Pearl. So that's through all. you, Mayor, in the policy itself, uh, the the current um, officer's recommendation is that it is placed on the website quarterly and that a report comes informally to the council chamber quarterly as well. So it, it's um, presented in two, um, in two forums. Um, Councillors may wish to refer reflect uh, both a council report and a web and the website um, monthly let's leave it as monthly then yep okay. 
Secretary. Through you, Matt, can you take the word council out? And uh, Councillor Pearl is just seeking a monthly report, I believe. Thank you. Madam Mayor, as the seconder, I'm okay with that change, just so you know. Madam Mayor. Uh, Councillor Clark. Sorry, just to clarify, can you just clarify what we've just said then? It's going to be published on the website monthly and reported monthly to Council? Through you, Mayor, the current policy um, at, that's before you now as a draft policy is indicating that quarterly there would be a report on the website, so that it, it would be updated on the website, but also in the same way that the Assembly of Councils come before you formally into the Chamber monthly, um, that, or sorry, quarterly, um, that a report would come in, a separate report would come into the Council Chamber um, detail any allowances and expenses that occurred during that period. That, that's what the draft policy currently states. Uh, I think there, there's a question around the frequency of that and whether that happens quarterly or monthly. So to clarify, it's both, it would be both on the website and brought into it as a report if, the, if this motion was to get up? Monthly. Does that answer your question, Councillor Clark? I think so. <laughs> I think it's confusing. So I'm just going to say it out loud. So the, the motion that Councillor Pearl has put before us means that we would get a report put on the website monthly and um, a report brought into Council monthly. Is that what we are about to discuss and debate? Yes. Great. Okay. Uh, Councillor Pearl, did you want to... Another question. Okay. I Do just we wanted need you to... second to it, right? Yeah, no worries. I'll just address the uh, amendment first and then in, when I close up I'll address the, the, the motion itself. Uh, the purpose of this small amendment is to move it from the current proposed three months to one month. He, he, here's the reasoning behind it and will be the best council I think in Victoria that does this and the most transparent council. So if we go for the three months you're actually saying it's four or five months. Because you know, so if we, if we book something in, let's work backwards I say, August, um, no council meeting, September rather, no council meeting in January, that report may not come back until that, that quarterly spending until February. So if you spend some money in the first week of September, it can actually be the fourth or fifth month by the time it actually gets reported to a council meeting, unless the quarter closes off. Um, this way, it's reported effectively transparently within one month. Um, no council in Victoria, so far as I'm aware, has this level of transparency. Uh, and it's a logical thing to do. Does it create more office of time? I can see that it will, uh, but I don't think it's a, a huge amount more office of time. The officers would have to be doing this work in any case. Uh, it's just an additional uh, commitment that this council has to full transparency and uh, it, I think will will allay any concerns that our community have um, that we're not claiming things uh, in an appropriate cycle, we're not um, being transparent about it. it. It puts it all on the table. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, Councillor Baxter. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, yep, happy to support uh, this uh, amended uh, motion. Um, there, it's, uh, there's lots of things that I guess I, I could say over, about the entire um, councillor expenses and support um, policy, um, but just that, uh, you know, we're... We're, we're required to have a, a, a policy around um, these sorts of things and I think we've come to a good um, place where um, councillors can get the support they need uh, to do their job um, and, and if they incur uh, expenses uh, under reasonable conditions they can have those um, reimbursed uh, and also allows for uh, councillors to undertake personal development that will um, make them better at their job and make them better at serving our community. So um, I think that's really good and I think that this, um, this amendment uh, is good as well. Um, I'm all in favour of a more transparency uh, around this sort of stuff. And um, the, only, the only slight concern I have is about um, uh, how, how quickly councillors will have to uh, make claims in order to make sure that we're meeting um, these sort of deadlines, but that's, that's on us. We'll have to be very quick about those sorts of things. Um, and I... I really do anticipate that most of these will be very boring 
um, that that will just show how much we get paid in our allowance, which is with the same amount every single month. Um, uh, and then occasionally there'll be a little um, a, a thing in there where we had to um, do a course or, or go to a seminar or whatever that might be. So, um, but uh, yeah, um, I think it's going to be good. Uh, Councillor Clark. Through you, Madam Mayor, um, I'm very happy to support this motion. Um, expenses was an issue in the last council and certainly uh, I received a lot of feedback about it. Uh, and I think this motion allows us to bring even greater transparency to councillors' expenses. Um, and by publishing it on the website monthly, I think that gives residents great confidence and transparency to see councillors' expenses. Uh, in a timely manner, to uh, Marcus's point, uh, quarterly is, is a long time. Uh, and also, as, uh, as Tim has said, if there's an error, it can be fixed quickly and isn't allowed to go on for a longer period of time. So uh, I'm, I'm very happy to see this change and bringing even greater transparency to, um, to this council and, and for the residents. Thanks. Any other councillors? Councillor Consolo? I have a little clar clarifying question about the meeting procedure. So if this is approved, if we all vote for this and it passes or however many, we're done with this one. So if I want to speak to it, I should speak to it now about uh, just the policy in general, not this amendment. No, no, you can. This is the amendment. Am I? Oh, motion. Okay. So, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Um, then I'd like to just speak in general. Uh, I understand the alt motion with increased transparency, and, and that's good. Hopefully, if it is a problem at an officer level, we were made aware and we can possibly bring it back in. I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm thankful that childcare expense is available so that someone like me can participate and represent the community. Uh, however, the amount of red tape that's required is, is a lot, and it's upsetting. I haven't embarked on it yet, and also because of how previous councillors, previous council terms, it didn't seem to support childcare. Now maybe that was a different separate issue, but I just want to make sure that everyone is on board with what we're supporting here, what we're doing here, and the expenses that we all have to incur are different for each of us, and to be respectful of why they exist. I want to speak, but would anyone else like to speak before me? I will. Um, I won't be supporting this alt motion. Uh, I can understand the reasons for transparency and all that. I just think that there is better use of our officers' time. I think quarterly is just fine. Uh, I think. Does it change any outcomes for our community? No, it doesn't. Uh, and I also won't be supporting it because in the past, just as Councillor Consolo referred to, it has been weaponised and it's been used for political reasons and I'm not in support of that. I know that uh, Councillor Consolo has spoken to me. One, it's a difficult because a lot of babysitting or, or child minding is done through not necessarily official agencies and so, so far Councillor Consolo has not used any of the childcare that is designed, these allowances, to help her to represent her community. And part of the reason of also doing it is the fear of what might be said on social media and crazy things like that. And I'm not okay with that. So this idea of monthly, I feel that it has what it could be used for or what the reason that it's been come to council as an op option is not necessarily something that I think is positive for people on the council, nor do I think it delivers anything for our community. Uh, I want Councillor Consolo or anyone else who has genuine need to use these allowances to help them attend uh, council meetings and all the other event, uh, events and liaising with our community to be able to use them. Otherwise, it becomes a very privileged, uh, and we are in a privileged council, I won't under debate that, but it becomes it becomes a very narrow group of people who are privileged enough to be able to sit on council. And we need diversity, and we do not use to, need to use these allowances to make people feel that they can't use them or that they will be publicly shamed for using them. So I won't be supporting monthly. I think quarterly is quite enough. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak to it? Shall we put this to the, motion, uh, to the vote? I'll put the motion. I'll close this. Sorry, Councillor uh, Pearl. 
Thanks very much, Madam Mayor. Um, just to address a couple of your points there. Um, better use of time for officers. I, I, I don't foresee this, this process is going to take a material amount of time if someone's doing it monthly um, versus quarterly. I would say probably 20% more time perhaps. Um, but the data, the same process, same data entry has to be entered, same process. The only difference is it needs to be uh, copy and paste, change dates on and the amounts of the council report coming to council and then uploading to the website. So uh, yes, it's going to take longer, but I don't think it's, it's onerous. Um, there's, in terms of what Councillor Consolo was saying and also you, Madam Mayor, if you think that the... Um, protocols around childcare are too rigorous, then there's nothing to stop you from putting a motion here this evening from making it less rigorous. I, I personally thought it was a bit onerous to have, I think, a working for, ch like working for children thing. I don't think there's too many babysitters. That, perhaps they all have it, I don't know. I just never asked for it. But if it's too rigorous and it's not workable, this is the opportunity that councillors have to change the policy. So I, I know some people, you, Madam Mayor, you, you're taking umrage with the one month, but really I think what you the one month is not going to uh, weaponise anything um, in terms of stopping somebody from being able to use the policy in a functional way. Uh, if the policy is has a gap in it, put a motion forward and we'll consider to change it. That, that's what this process is all about. Um, what I would say is this council has a history of high councillor expenses and our community uh, has voiced their dissatisfaction of that. In 2018, we were, we, were the, we were the highest council other than, I think, the City of Melbourne. It was well publicised, I think, at $98,000 in councillor expenses, which um, there was a few things that added into that, um, into making that number quite high in terms of the, the mayor that year undertook a, a very expensive course, um, as well as a couple of people did the company director's courses, as well as a large onerous amount of childcare. But what, what also in the subsequent years in 19 and 20, it meant that there was an internal audit investigation that cost $63,000. So we, we have some pedigree we have to cover for in terms of transparency. This report does that. This policy does that. It picks up on the recommendations from the $63,000 we invested in that audit. Um, it takes advantage of the state government changes. Uh, this amendment, this motion here this evening, um, is a fail-safe way of ensuring that our community understand the, expectable, the expected standards that councillors have to stick to and to ensure that we are sticking to it. You would have to be a half-wit, excuse my language, but you'd have to be a half-wit to victimise somebody uh, for appropriately using councillor expenses. Uh, and I've gone on the public record to defend my councillor expenses to, to 200,000 people on, on radio. Um, I've never said that people shouldn't be using them for legitimate council expenses, and if anyone feels victimised for it, we have a meeting procedure uh, and a process to ensure that that shouldn't happen, and I would hope that this council doesn't ever have a culture of that occurring. So um, I'll leave it to you, councillors, but I, I think you've got a, a good policy here. We now have a good transparent process to ensure that our community understands what's going on, uh, but under no circumstances should this stop you claiming legitimate expenses to get your job done. Um, you're paid an allowance, which is a, a reasonable amount of money. It's more than a million dollars over the four years that we all get paid as a cumulative, as a cumulative cost just in our allowances to uh, the ratepayers. Um, and the ratepayers are, in my experience, perfectly adequate and reasonable in their approach to us claiming reasonable expenses. Uh, and this amendment and this policy should not stop you from doing that. I urge you to vote for it. Thank you. Put that motion. All those in favour? All those against? That motion has passed. Uh, we'll move on to notices of motion. Councillors, we have no notices of motion tonight. Uh, reports by councillor delegates. Do we have any reports from councillor delegates? Not tonight. Uh, there are no items of urgent business, councillors, so we will move on to our confidential matters. We do have one confidential item tonight being local roads and community infrastructure. 
Uh, so I now call on a councillor uh, to move that the meeting be closed to members, Councillor Bond, and seconded by Councillor Pearl, um, so we can consider this confidential item. Uh, I will now put that motion. All those in favour, that motion is passed. Uh, thank you, Teresa. Safe journey home.